Miraculous was an interesting, funny show with wacky heroes that rattled the foundation of what could be done in family animation. Or at least that's what everyone thought. In actuality, Miraculous is a terribly written, horribly handled mess of characters, cliches, and so many bad decisions that it's like being the only single person at a couple's event. Uncomfortable. A show that is little more than a cornucopia of tropes that haven't been allowed to die since the 90s, and terrible ideas that have persisted to this day. To the point, there's an entire subcategory of fans dedicated to picking apart the show, and that is not undeserved. Everything about the show is shallow and lazy. It's killed off whatever goodwill it initially garnered, and now people are just trying to figure out what sort of the domino chain that got us to where we are today. And that's what I'm gonna do, going as in depth as I possibly can, finding that elusive answer to what exactly caused this shit show to go off the rails. Someone end my pitiful existence, this is a thorough deconstruction of Miraculous Ladybug, a garbage show that is bad. Miraculous. Stilted man, I am Hawkmoth. Why does everything need to be so fluid these days? I'm giving you the power to make everything you touch stiff and rigid. The animation in this show is something I can universally find to be decent most of the time. I'm starting off here because I need you to understand that while I do hate this show and find it to be one of the most mind-numbing things on the air given its pacing, writing, characters, and generally everything else that isn't this, the animation itself is fine. It's not amazing, it's not stunning, it's just fine. From what I've seen, the show has good storyboards, good line work, the rigs are all stable, and they don't use squash and stretch all that often, which makes things feel more realistic at times, which for a 3D animated show can be easier to achieve than 2D animated shows. By the way, keep this in mind, I'm gonna do a thing later. For a majority of the show's lifetime, it had four animation teams, Smag, Assemblage, Symbiosis, and DQ, and unlike the restaurants, they aren't a treat. These four studios go into setting order of quality, with some of the best looking episodes being made by all of them at different times, and also Cat Blanc, which has the weird filter over it, but it's whatever. Smag are commonly referred to as the best of the series because the episodes they work on look almost completely different from the other three studios. The lighting is better, the rendering is better, the subtle details on the characters are better, just little things like that. Tiny details, which is why Jeremy Zag took them to go make the movie for this series, given the quality they were pumping out for this show and how much they weren't getting paid, Jeremy just ran off with what he knew worked and left Thomas with assemblage for mostly big events and DQ for everything else in between. Since this, DQ has become the lead animation team, with Symbiosis getting fired over, and I'm not kidding here, Teenage Girl Jiggle Physics. The show's fucking weird, man. Not saying that it's right to sexualize a 14 year old character, god knows I can't get away with that, but it was A, four frames of animation, and B, probably done in the physics engine, not the animators. Regardless, we're left with an alright animation style and an objectively okay at best one for no other reason than money and some wonky animation. DQ honestly does fine. For a weekly animated show, I'm willing to forgive some wonky angles here, or even bad lip sync. However, their lighting engine needs to be used. Like, now. For some reason, Season 4, and I will go into Season 4 on its own, don't you worry, but Season 4 just has these flat, blank shots with no shadows, or the lighting just isn't working, or the textures on the character's face just disappear for no reason. Like, what the fuck is this? The only shot I've ever seen people kick up a storm about that I immediately understood why it looks wonky but isn't is when Marinette gives Rose the pink anklet and her thumb looks stretched. It's not. It's still proportional to her hand. We're just getting a unique angle and her thumb is a solid color. It's going to look off no matter what, and it's like a two second shot, guys. Come on. This is why I say the animation is a huge priority for me in this show, because even at its fucking worst, it's just not as important as the story that's going on in it. While yes, the transformation sequences are nice, and are probably the most universally loved part of the show given that they're constant, despite how Sailor Moon it ends up becoming after a few episodes. I promise I'll never take Chloe's advice again. Really? <laughs> Although it's still fucking hilarious in Rocketeer that when Adrian transforms, he's all sad, so they just play the transformation and clearly just keyframe his mouth down and it still gets me to this day. Oh, that's so lazy. My personal favorite is probably Viperion for this little hand thing he does when he puts on the mask and it's so cute. Luca is probably one of my favorite Pixar movies. Oh, and this guy's pretty good too. Something else I like is that for the different forms they take and even when they swap powers, there are completely unique animations. They aren't just reusing them in every scenario. It's a nice attention to detail. Until they stop doing this for no reason. 
Fucking Kuro Neko. That's another thing I'll get into later, but Adrian really does get shortchanged after a while. There are plenty of people out there who will talk about how something looks and stick on that for the majority of the time, but never talk about the story, especially if they like it. The amount of times I've heard a variation on, this is Disney's newest animated movie, insert title here, and while I had issues with the story, can I just say I loved how this looked? It was so pretty! Like, bitch, we get it. It looks nice. Don't ask for brownie points for stating the obvious. Saying the animation is mediocre or less good than early Pixar is like saying the sky is blue on a clear day because that's how our eyes perceive color. It's a neutral statement of fact because it's a weekly cable animated show run by a company that slashed the animation budget for no other reason than capitalism. It doesn't fucking matter to the quality of the thing you're watching. When was the last time a live action show or movie was criticized for lackluster camera work or lighting? It wasn't because unless it's got a shit bastard ton of CGI in it, who gives a fuck on how it's shot on a scene to scene basis? It's just there so that you get the information you need to tell what the fuck is even happening. Now, yes, when good shots are used in Edgar Wright films and such, those deserve praise, like this shot of the building looking like a road, or this practical stunt that puts people's lives in danger. Yes, you reward those individual things, but you don't then go off and slag the rest of the movie for looking like every other movie, because why would you? This is why this section is first and foremost so that you understand that even I have my negativity limits and can say that the show isn't galling to look at. It's fine. It's colorful, I know who everyone is, and I can honestly say I've never been lost on what is happening on screen. The camera work, the shot composition, and color palettes of things all blend together really well no matter what team is working on them. Yes, even DQ, and yes, even Cat Blanc looks nice, which just proves my point on that episode even further. If you'll remember in my Cat Blanc video, I talked about a lot of the show's issues and essentially did a mini checklist of this video as it stands, but the animation never came up, and I will tear into that episode again later, but for now it helps with the animation discussion, because it didn't need to be brought up there, it was fine, and that's the best praise I can give the show on the whole in terms of its visuals. It's fine. Stalkerella. It's a shame the boy you like doesn't notice you, isn't it? Well, I'm giving you the power to follow him wherever he goes, with no consequences. Marinette Dupin Chang is one of the two titular characters and is a clusterfuck to talk about. And to show you what I mean, this is the first scene of the series. Not the season, not of an episode, of the fucking series. And before you say the Bubbler's production order is number 9, it's paced like a pilot and was the first one on Netflix and the second one on Disney+. Plus. However, the air dates in Korea were a day apart, and the Bubbler aired in the US first before stormy weather by two weeks. So before you get on me that this isn't right, Yes, it is. Hell, even Pharaoh was aired before her. How weird is that? <gasps> Happy birthday! <laughs> Happy birthday! <laughs> <sighs> Happy birthday, Adrian. <laughs> Now, I want you to think really hard on what this scene sets up about Marinette in those 20 or so seconds. Well, she's clumsy, and she's got a crush on a guy named Adrian who is also a model. This is perfectly fine as a starting place for a character. Having a love interest and a definable trait is solid characterization in less than a minute of your show. The problem is that, outside of her willingness to help others, her hatred of any girl that gets close to Adrian because teenage gay people don't exist, oh wait, yeah they do, just in the background. Over there, away from the white passing heterosexual main couple, and we'll fucking get to that. And her rather bizarre undiagnosed ADHD, this is the only characterization she will get for the rest of the series. All of these things are shown in the first episode so well that I'm astonished the show doesn't do anything with it. It elaborates on these traits and double, triples, and even quadruples down on them with very little in the way of introspection, and the few times there are those moments, the episode either ends or, frankly, just forgets it was the problem and invents a new problem to be mad about out of whole cloth or just doesn't let people stay mad at her because magic butterflies ex machina. Example. Timebreaker. In this episode, Marinette is tasked with watching her parents' bakery for one of the reoccurring characters to come get a Tower of Macrons in the shape of the Eiffel Tower, because Paris, but runs off to hold up a banner at a race her friends are doing for dares because logic. And she can't be late because it's not as if the teenagers who took the time to come here can't wait the 15 or so minutes. You'll be late to hold up a banner that is only here to facilitate the plot in the first place? Quick, shirk your responsibilities for short-term gain! Anyway, she goes off to do... 
that it has to help hold up the banner. Alex, the victim of the week, asks all you to hold her watch. Through some shenanigans, the watch is broken despite it being a miraculous that we've been told can't be destroyed by anything but Cat Noir's cataclysm, but fuck it, I guess they hadn't written that rule in yet. And the side character calls saying that she's at the store but Marinette isn't there so she can't give the cake. Now, she clearly fucked up and should have told her friends to wait or meet up after and watch the video all you took, which fine, completely understandable, characters have to have flaws. How does she react to her mistake? Does she take ownership, apologize, and accept the punishment for cutting her parents' 20th anniversary short, along with ruining the reputation with one of the city's most important people, who is also, incidentally, the city's local news anchor? Or does she, like, rush up and apologize for being late? Ha! <laughs> nope! Because this episode has time travel in it, and this show, that means nothing ever fucking matters. She follows Timebreaker back to five minutes ago so she can tell her past self to rush home to get the cake to Nadia, the newsmaker's name is Nadia, thus resolving her of her mistake and leaving no lasting consequences, and in fact helps her win the fight against two villains since she now has two lucky charms. I should probably explain the powers in this show for those of you who haven't seen it or haven't watched the Cat Blanc video. The way the powers work in Miraculous is that there are these things called Kwamis, and they are tied to a specific artifact, be it a crown, a brooch, a comb, a bracelet, and a necklace a ring, earrings, it doesn't matter. So long as it can be worn on a person, it can be miraculous. Also, uh, those aren't old man Joseph glasses. They need fucking arms. That's how they don't fall off your face. When wanting to activate the Magical Kid transformation, they need to say the creature's name and an animal-specific command, and BOOM! They get to be a superhero for however long the plot allows. The generic abilities are super strength, agility, durability, and apparently a magical mask that hide their identities, even though that's never demonstrated, only ever told to us, but whatever. Each jewel comes with a handy-dandy special ability dedicated to their respective animal's personality or iconography. For example, the monkey disrupts powers, which plays into the monkey's playful nature. The tiger has a loud roar that makes people listen to you, the bee has a stinger that that immobilizes someone, the rabbit is time travel because Disney, the black cat has bad luck taken to a destructive degree, and the ladybug gives the power of creation because... polka dots? Yeah, that one doesn't really add up. From what I gather, it's supposed to be luck, and much like the cat is bad luck that is cranked to 22 to mean destruction, so must go for the ladybug and good luck meaning creation. Each of these abilities can be used once per transformation, and for the kids, that means they have five minutes before they transform back into themselves, because transforming and doing their one-time thing drains their Kwame so much so that they need to eat afterwards. It's like Tamagotchis, but with PHENOMENAL COSMIC POWER! The Lucky Charm, Ladybug's one-time use ability, gives her a wacky new tool to do whatever the fuck she needs to do in order to get the bad guy's emo goth object, break their personal property, and then reverse everything back to the way it was before the bad guy started wrecking shop. Okay, I know that's a lot to take in, but that's just the general power setup. Let's get back to Little Miss Creepy here. Marinette is now able to win the day because she has random bullshit items that she was able to use in unique ways. This is often played for humor, like one time she got a massive rocket launcher that she took the sight off of to distract a brainwashed Cat Noir. Again, put a pin in it, I'll get to him next, so that Queen B could stun the mayor, who had been given the power to have anyone listed him, regardless of how ridiculous the order was. This and many other examples showcase her out of the box thinking, and overall is an asset to her character and the series. However, where this becomes a problem is that the show just makes her intelligent and able to think of wacky shirt on the fly and almost instantly get what it's for. Like this one time she was given a pillow to defeat a villain, and the way in order to use it was to rip the thing open and grab a feather so she could tickle the armpit of said villain. Like, how and why would you come to that conclusion? It's funny, but it just... how? The show also has her have this weird spy vision to keep the audience in and how her train of thought is progressing, and they eventually started bleeding into everyday life. And then Cat Noir. And then her mother. Like, it stops being a cool insight into her way of thinking when four seasons in, you just give it to other characters, guys. This leads probably into the biggest problem with Marinette from a plot sense. She can't ever be wrong. I mentioned this earlier, but now I'm going to expand on it. Pretty much from the moment the series starts, Marinette is able to do petty, stupid things and see no consequences for them because she's the main character and... No, that's really it. This is going to be relevant later, but Thomas has this weird aversion to everyone except Marinette. And when I say that, I mean it literally. She's the cool one. She's the star. You have to like her, otherwise the show won't work. And guess what? She's written to be flawless. I'm not saying she doesn't have character flaws, but the way the story frames those flaws isn't exactly you know, good. For example, Marinette is clumsy. She stumbles, she flubs her words a lot, and is a nervous wreck for several reasons outside of being a superhero. But this is never the focus of an episode. It's just there when the plot needs it to be. She'll trip over nothing, drop important items when it's convenient, fall out of bed a lot. Things that would maybe cause some lasting injuries or a sprain or something, but no, it's just for laughs. However, when she dons the suit, all of that is gone. She is effortlessly able to run, jump, and evade enemies while throwing a magic yo-yo and swing around like she's Spider-Gwen. 
again. Now, I said earlier that these suits augment your abilities, but that doesn't mean that you should be able to do everything perfectly fine with no overlap. Everyone else who gets the jewel is just them in a new outfit and sometimes a new hairstyle, but that's really it. She's the only one to get a complete character overhaul and it's never explained. And no, magic doesn't count. I said before explaining the magic is dumb and shouldn't be a thing, however when basic character traits are removed by saying a phrase, I think that needs explaining more so than whatever the fuck Avatar Wong was doing a thousand years ago. This goes one step further though. For example, in Antibug when Chloe is trying to find Banager, her best friend turned villain Sabrina, Marinette doesn't listen and sends Chloe off. The reason being, she hates Chloe in real life for being a brat and a liar. This time though, Chloe was right and knew exactly where the Akuma was. Her anger at Ladybug is what causes her to be Akumatized and sparks the second half of the episode. This is the only time in the show that Marinette is completely in the wrong and makes Chloe in the right and still Chloe gets turned evil. Marinette is an irrational person, she doesn't think ahead and is just going through life a mile a minute out of the suit, so applying that in the suit seems like good character work, but when the consequence of that action is applied to another character, that's not good writing, that's blame shifting. And I get she's got a history with Chloe and is applying it to this dynamic, however, Chloe has no idea who the fuck she is in the suit and is in fact one of her biggest fans to the point in this episode she was in a ladybug costume most of the time. All she had to do was treat it like a work relationship. Just be civil and don't jump to conclusions based on this new dynamic. Speaking of dynamics, I'm debating if I should put her obsession with Adrian here or in the romance section because there will be a large amount of overlap. I think here works best because the romance section will be more about the other characters and the way the two leads interact in that love diamond. So Marinette is very extra and is very much someone with which the phrase chill out has never even been in the same room with. Remember the first scene of the show and how I said it established her two big character traits? Well this is what 90% of the B story is in this show. Sure there are subplots here and there that are more season based or tied to a side character, but the B plot of the show is Adrian and Marinette and whatever awkward way they're fumbling over each other this week. From his perspective she's a friend he's developing feelings for. On her side he is the star in the moons, her muse, her reason to breathe. When he's not around all she does is think about him and what she can do for him. This woman is defined by her non-relationship to this man. To the point it is our introduction to her for Christ's sake. I cannot overstate this enough. This is the first thing the writers thought we had to know about her, and it's weird. She follows him around, breaks into his photo shoots, breaks into his house, follows him around, has a goddamn calendar with his schedule on it down to the minute at the start of episode 5 of the series. She makes him gifts not only for his next 50th birthdays, but also 5th names day, Bastille day, whatever the fuck that is, and even holidays. Like we get it, she goes overboard on things guys, but there's a limit where exaggeration goes from being funny to creepy. Her knowing his schedule off hand is funny. Her making him like six different gifts and can't decide which one to give him is cute. Having her have a small crush on him that makes her tongue tied is relatable. Any one of the things you had her do is grounds for a restraining order, but all of them at the same time warrants her being sent to a psych ward. She followed him to another continent for God's sake. Come on now! How do you look at that for a story and go, yeah this is totally a fine lesson to teach the kids, what's the big deal? You degenerate fuck? I'm genuinely curious how this made it past the first draft and no one shot it down. Oh wait, I know why. I get it, I was a teenager and I had crushes on boys, something fierce, but the most I ever did was work up the nerve to talk to them and get shot down, and the ones I did get to know were really great. One of them became a really good lifelong friend, and it was done through being confident and honest with them, not shoving gifts in their face and learning their schedule. And yes, I learned this as a newly out gay kid at 14 in fucking Indiana in 2010. So yes, this 14 year old straight girl can absolutely figure this out. Marinette is a character who is impulsive, self-motivated, and wants one person so badly to the detriment of her surrounding relationships, both in and out of the suit. She's a social butterfly, but she needs to learn when to go back in the cage for a while or simply settle down and not be so out of control, especially when Lila and Chloe are involved. Oh, and the fact that her friends all just let her do these things to and for Adrian is bad writing. Someone should either stop her or just fucking tell him so he can make an informed decision and make a move on her. And I think that's enough about her for now. Let's look at someone a little less complicated. Mopadope, you want to be seen. Feel valued by a teammate. Fall into despair and give in to the power of destruction. 
Adrian Agrest is one of my favorite characters in this show. I'm sorry, I know my card's on the table and my hand is showing. I like the depressed cis white boy, big shocker, but the reason I like him so much is because he's got way more depth going on than Marinette. I'll explain his faults here in a moment, but just let me say what I like about him. Adrian is an isolated 14 year old boy who just wants to be normal. His father, a famous fashion designer, keeps him to a rigid schedule and makes it so that he basically has no free time. In fact, in the Origins episode, we learned that he enrolled himself in school. He filled out the paperwork. Work. He walked to school. He did all of this to be a normal teenager. For Marinette, I showed her first scene, and I think it's relevant to do that here as well. Hmm. Your schedule, Adrian. Thanks, Natalie. Hey, uh, my father get back to you about my birthday party? Well, um, he doesn't think it would be a good idea. Of course not. Happy birthday, Adrian. That's it. He's just calmly eating breakfast and is disappointed his father bailed on him again for work. The very next scene demonstrates his other big character trait, his unwillingness to stand up to his father. These two traits are shown consistently as his two biggest problems in the series. They add a lot to scenes, and while they're overplayed in favor of actually doing more dynamic things with him, they are at least banal character traits that aren't actively going to get him arrested. His backstory about how he's been sequestered since he was a child, and that being doubled down on since his mother went missing, goes a long way to help care Characterize him. This will go into a bit of Chloe as well, and don't worry, she's next, but what I'm about to say will color her as well. Given that both of their parents are rich, influential men, it stands to reason they'd have their children be friends, and it's even hinted at throughout the series that Andre and Gabriel are long-term friends who sent their children to the same private elementary school, and even arranged playdates with one another for either business or just for the benefit of their children to learn how to socialize. It explains why he gives Chloe so many chances, and doesn't really give her flack for her blatant crush on him, or even just being a brat, because she does try for him and she's his oldest friend. He's not used to having so many and the fact that she's one of the few people he's allowed to see from his past that his father approves of, it's understandable that he'd be reluctant to cut her out, especially since they're in the same class and again, she does improve herself because of him and he knows this has a net positive effect in the class and the city on the whole. This does get ruined in season 4, but that's way later. For the first three seasons, you're able to see how he knows her so well and what he's capable of doing when he's comfortable with someone. Adrian is a parental abuse victim and has been broken down to take his father's orders without question. This is until his friends start acting in a positive influence on him and give him the confidence to ask for more time to himself and be more independent, something with which Gabe bites back against with almost giggling contempt. This is why I say Adrian is the character that grows the most. He has the most to grow from and has the most overall shift in the series. He mopes and tries to have a life and Gabe says no, but season 3 and 4 have him fighting back more and learning how to be more self-sufficient, and a big part of that is his role as Cat Noir. As the cat, he can be playful, he can be flirty, he can be reckless, and overall just be a 14 year old boy. This leads me into the duality of our two leads. On the one hand, you have a girl with typical high school responsibilities, homework, social obligations, helping with the family business, hobbies, and passions, but nothing people aren't expected to deal with on a day to day basis. And on the other, we have a kid who has to live up to unbelievable expectations, and an authoritarian who has nothing but his own motivations in mind, and forces his son to travel the world, take so many extracurriculars, and be in the public eye so much that he can't even go to a screening of his own own mother's movie without being mobbed in public. As the cat, he doesn't have that pressure, and in fact, all the pressure is laid on Marinette, and I will get into this later. As a character dynamic, it's super interesting, because while he understands the seriousness of the scenario they're in, how he copes with being practically invulnerable is with a big dopey smile, and enjoys the freedom he gets to play with now. But as with everything in this show, there is a counter to this positive bright spot in his life. And that's the fact that the show treats him like a sidekick to keep it as a girl show. See, the writers have opted to make the show aimed at little girls, and given the secondary lead to a boy to show that women are equal to, if not better, than men in different ways. Which, fine. I get that and see the potential in having a series with that mindset, so long as it's not condescending or makes the male heroes a joke. Yeah, about that. Cat Noir is the butt of most jokes in the show. Not to say that he's not competent in the fight or can't be serious, he overall just doesn't get to be the focus or even be the one to figure out the answer to the problem. It's always Marinette. Even in one of the better episodes of the series, Reflect All, in where the two leads swap powers for the day, it has her doubt him and explain how his powers work even though he's seen her do it no less than 66 times at this point. He knows how this works. Oh, and when she uses his quote-unquote simple power to destroy a Senta monster, she's forgiven for making 
something is worse because they never cataclysm one, so they wouldn't know its effect. Once again, she is assigned no blame and is always right when it matters. It's established in this episode that the powers work differently for different people. He's a rather blunt and to the point person, and they need something that can reflect the doll's laser and operate as an object to stick in the doll's head slot. Even though I would have just gone through the eye again like you did to get reflector herself, but whatever. Oh, also, also, she just gets how to twirl that fucking baton like she's been an ROTC her whole life, but he can't swing a yo-yo? I'm calling bullshit. Very effective, Mr. Bug. But I thought- May I remind you that the Lucky Charm doesn't just give you an object to defeat the villain with? Uh, yes it does. You just saw it do that. If I could just get my hands on a mirror, I'd be able to reflect her own beam back at her. A mirror! This ties into my theory that she has ADHD and he has autism because of how the powers work, and is probably why Master Fu gave them the miraculous he did in the first place. This episode was annoying, but from Marinette's characterization of things, works really well for him because it shows just how out of his element he is when he's put in charge. He's frustrated, he's annoyed, and he's not used to being the one that has to do all the heavy lifting in his life. On the other hand, it shows his critical thinking skills and his ability to retain information, as he reflects <laughs> on their previous battle with Reflecta to inform how to defeat the doll, something Marinette chides him for even though for the first time in a long time, he's fucking right. The sad thing about Adrian is that he's a passenger in his own life, and he desperately wants to be in the driver's seat, and when he gets to be that as Cat Noir, he still has to play second fiddle to someone else, but he's now viewed as a partner, he's equal to someone, and that's fine for him. It's when he's put in the role of leader when he flounders, and that's amazing character work. Marinette, for all of her faults, can command a crowd and is able to lead people when she needs to, and that is remarkably consistent throughout the series. I didn't bring that up before because it applied better here. The show often portrays these two as partners, but never delivers on it in the big ways. For instance, the aforementioned Master Fu. Fu never fully meets Adrian for a sit-down conversation until the middle of Season 2, and Marinette meets him at the end of Season 1 technically before that as well, but it was under a lie. And while, yes, she doesn't really interact with him on screen fully until season two, it's 13 episodes before Adrian gets to even know who he is. It's still way earlier than it should have been, and frankly, needed to be fixed. From the moment he learns of the Guardian, he feels left out. He never really gets to interact with him again until near the end of season three, when the fucker took back his miraculous out of fear of his past actions. This is a consistent through line that leads to deeper depression, self-doubt, and feelings of inadequacy, because the one person he thought would treat him like an equal is keeping him in the dark like everyone else in his life. All of this comes to a head in Kuroneku. This probably is my favorite episode for Adrian because it shows him getting fed up being left in the lurch and giving up the mantle of Paris' secondary hero for the sake of others since he clearly isn't being utilized in the same way as the other 10 heroes are at that point in the show. So he gives up the ring and says fuck this and goes home to be depressed. Now that he finally has nothing left to work with, his life goes back to the way it was before sad and alone. Plague then convinces Marinette to let him choose the next wearer, at which point he goes straight back to Adrian, but has him change everything about himself to have her take him back, which has her fall in love with him and asks Plague to give the ring back to the original owner so that she won't stumble over herself around him, and from that point forward, he seemed to be on better standing in the group. Yeah, the show lampshades how he's still not the main guy anymore, but she makes sure he knows how much he matters to her, and that's great. This episode tells him that being himself is the best thing for him to do, that having his feelings is valid, that speaking up will get results, and trying to be someone else isn't going to work, and, if anything, is a hindrance to the well-being of the team. It's decent writing. Anybody else notice this kid gets the best fucking episodes? Oh, wait, how could you when he gets, like, one a season? The closest thing he gets to taking charge outside of Reflect Doll is in Simon Says, where he just isn't having any of Gabe's shit, and it's glorious. I'll reinforce the outer defenses. Go hide in the atrium. It's not safe in here. No one tells me what to do. Not even a superhero. You're in danger like everyone else, so stop pretending you're above us all and just do what I tell you to. More Cat Noir Gabe moments, please. This one-sided tension a la Chloe and Ladybug works here because the power dynamic has now been flipped to be more equal. Expanding on the dynamic of the cat and the bug, there need be said his interactions with Ladybug in the romantic sense. Here's the thing, I don't see a problem with how he interacts with her because he never forces anything on her. He flirts, he confesses his feelings, he plans dates, and he tries to get her to see his value as a romantic partner as well as a work partner. The show doesn't ever frame him as crossing a line, but more so just him not getting it, which, again, is in line with his character. People often act like he's completely in the wrong here because she says no, and that should be it. She loves someone else and doesn't have feelings for him, and he respects it. While his feelings won't magically go away from hearing that, 
that, he has toned down the flirtiness and even got a girlfriend separate from her, and it was a good time. I'd have flipped their respective love interests, but hey, what do I know? What I'm getting at here is that the show goes out of its way to express that he understands her boundaries and isn't going to cross them while doing his damnedest to show her that they can work together, which is not a bad thing. Again, I was 14 once and a bit of a romantic, but I always knew where the line was, and so does he. Being persistent is not a bad thing, and it's not like she doesn't flirt back or touch him in a flirty way or anything like that. The show has this weird consistent writing thing. Oh, I'm sorry, I seem to have paused there. Where, when it's the focal point of an episode, she's offended and appalled they would even suggest something like that, but then will play with his bell or give him a cute nickname or exchange one-liners. Things he does as a flirty joke. I'm sorry, it's not his fault he doesn't understand where the line is all the time when she keeps moving it. Imagine if your crush did stuff like this, even after telling you no, you'd be lost on what to do and probably just keep doing what you were doing beforehand. Not because you don't respect them, but because you're unclear of the boundaries that are in place. So, no, I don't see this as a character flaw, I see this as a writing issue that has yet to be fixed. And if the whole civilian superhero thing are supposed to be inverses of each other, and this is meant to be crossing a line in some regard, he flirts with her too much, she breaks federal laws. I think he's allowed to be a little flirty given this context, not to mention you have to take in the context around his situation. The one person who gets to see the real him, who is confident, strong, self-assured, and relies on him, and is the first new friend he made since starting his new life, along with him having very little understanding of healthy, normal relationships, be they familiar, romantic, or platonic, of course he's gonna fall for her, and of course he's gonna gun hard for it. It's not like her where she had several options that could make her happy, or had a normal upbringing in proper society. She's the only one who knows him on such a deep level that no one else really gets to. It's basic human emotion. And before you cry foul that I'm condemning the woman for her crush and excusing the man for his, which thank you very much for ignoring the whole point of me talking about this, I'm not holding these two things up and removing the context of both instances to she's a little clingy and he's persistent. It's like equating stealing from a bank and stealing from a cookie jar. One has massive implications and will fuck up the economy of the town for a while, and is illegal, and the other is just gonna put some calories on your hips. Do you see what I mean now? Adrian is a character with a lot of story potential, not only from the life he leads, but also by virtue of the fact his father is the main antagonist of the series, but isn't our focal point because a show aimed at little girls must have a female lead at all times 100% full stop, do not pass go, and go directly to internet jail. This kid is funny, interesting, has much more varied setups for stories, and overall can be so much more than he is, but is left outside in the cold like a kitten nobody wanted because feminism, except not really. This is my kid now. Now. I'm adopting him and going to do something fun with him. And no, you can't stop me. Come along, kitty. We've got to get our garden ready for a certain little bee. Squanderer, it's everyone's dream to be famous. And what better way is there than being hated by them? I'm going to give you the power to make everyone you meet hate you so you may get the fame you so rightfully deserve. Chloe Bourgeois is a character that has been completely fucked sideways by this series with several large barbed wire anal plugs. Yes, that was graphic, that was the point. From the moment of her debut, she was categorized as a bog standard bully character that no one likes, but has to put up with for their family's wealth and power. Think brats, but you know, somehow worse. As I did with the other two, I'm going to show you her first scene and how this characterization is implemented. Don't tell me it's Adrian's birthday! Ugh. Ten seconds later. Did you get the gift I sent you? Uh, no. What? Oh, those delivery guys. I bet it was too heavy, so they had to go back and get another guy to help. Those slackers. I'll make sure they get it to you by tonight. Ten seconds later. What did you get him? I didn't. You did. <laughs> and it better be amazing, and it better not be late. So, what is Chloe's big first impression? Well, she forgets Adrian's birthday, tells him that's in the mail, and bullies her eternal punching bag Sabrina into overriding an enormous gift for him on her behalf. This shows us a lot actually about Chloe. Some are better than others, but I'll come back to that in a second. For one, it shows Chloe is a tad forgetful when it comes to other people. Not surprising, this is a pampered rich girl with no real stopping power on her rampages, but it also shows her ability to think on the fly and delegate tasks, something Marinette would capitalize on later in something like Darkblade. For the rest of the episode, her only motivation is to dance with Adrian, and for the majority of season one, her goal is to foil Marinette's attempts to be with him or just be the center of attention. Season one does have her be shown up several times and being about as pleasant as a horde of wasps in July. This trend continues all the way until the middle of season two, but then something happened, or rather, someone happened. A fast 
fashion show without the queen of style? Literally unacceptable. Style Queen is the epitome of base breaking when it comes to Chloe. It broke her mold and gave her more depth she desperately needed. In one two part episode, we get this beautifully picturesque explanation of who Chloe is and why she is the way she is simply by her mother showing up and being exactly like her, only with the clout to back it up. Chloe's parents are an interesting case study in terms of tertiary elements of a character because one's upbringing informs much more about the character than you'd think on a first go. For an example of a bad way this is done, Adrian. The show has framed the way his father is towards him as a long-standing problem that only got worse after Emily disappeared, just before the series started. However, later evidence contradicts this given that Adrian had a happy childhood from what it sounds like. He loved his parents, the few friends he was allowed to have he loved with all his heart, and despite his mother's illness, everything else seemed to be fine. But nope, in early seasons he's just always been a dick for no reason, and that's the way he's always been. Audrey and Andre have much more consistent characters characterization, and that informs Chloe even more so, as any good supporting character should. I know I'm framing Chloe as the third main character of this show, but for a while she kinda was. She learned the most, grew the most, changed the most, had the best arc, at least for a while, and overall had the most interesting things done with her, and it all began with Style Queen. This episode, in hindsight, was one of the smartest ideas the show has ever done. From the moment Audrey is introduced, she gives so much context to Chloe. Audrey is mean, callous, snobby, makes stab judgments, and treats everyone like her personal playthings for a laugh because she can. In the fashion world, her word is law. She can make or break a career. She literally made Gabe's, and that kind of power can go to one's head if not kept in check. Andre has been given more sympathetic characterization than Audrey hasn't been afforded because... Well, honestly, I can't figure out why. As much as I'm about to gush about this family as the prop up to Chloe, I can't find a reason Audrey has just been left to be the same person, or at worst, be a plot device when her husband hasn't been. I'm not saying Thomas has problems with women, I'm just gonna put the idea out there and let you ruminate on that while I keep going. Andre always wanted to be a filmmaker, even going so far as to make the film Adrian wanted to see in Gorizilla. It's a neat detail, as we all just assumed it was Audrey, but no, she forced him to stop for a political career while she was doing her own thing so he could pay for their children to be taken care of. The reason Chloe is able to bully her father the way she does throughout the series is because she saw her mother do it and he's so afraid of her that he could not bring himself to fight back. See, Audrey was away a lot when Chloe was a kid and her father made a big deal about her every time she was home. Along with her power and status being brought up as much as it was, it built up the idea in Chloe's head that she should emulate her behavior and honestly, can you blame her? I mean, it's her mom. Why would she, a literal child, not want to emulate their parents? Yeah, as a viewer, we can see this as a bad, but when you're a child, it's harder to understand that not everything is as amazing as it appears. It's often said that parents are the biggest influences on their children, and this right here is a textbook definition of it. For fuck's sake, Audrey had an affair and wanted the child of that affair to be gone so bad she sent her to another continent where she sees her, at most, three times a year. Is it a one that Chloe thinks the way she does not only about Zoe, but about everyone else? This leads me back to Style Queen. Due to some weird stuff requiring Marinette, when Chloe finds the Bee Miraculous, she takes it home for some reason, before going back to the fashion show, where, because of Marinette's design being in said show, Audrey asks her to go to New York, which she turns down because of how much it upsets Chloe. So, I guess that's nice. Because of this proposal, and never having been to New York with her own mother, who is now asking her rival to go with her, Chloe is admittedly peeved, and it prompts this response from Audrey. I'm exceptional too! The only exceptional thing about you, my dear, is your mother. And this... This right here is Chloe's major character flaw in a nutshell. I think I just summed it up in about five minutes, but that's how much this episode ripples throughout the show. You can keep your cat blogs and your gorizillas or even your fucking desperadas. This is an episode for the ages. I'd even say it's in my top five if I were pressed on it. From here, Chloe tries to find a crime, but can't. So, in her infinite wisdom, uses her power of immobilization to cause one to happen. It, of course, goes astray, leading the two leads to have to save the day and chase her down before she transforms back. In fact, them not trusting her is why she gets pallet swapped into a version that can control bees. This show is nothing if not on the nose, and you know what? Sometimes it works. Very rarely, but it does work sometimes. Once defeated, the news crews show up, and for fuck's sake, Audrey, on national television, tells everyone that Chloe is in no way exceptional. I mean, Jesus fuck! This woman is so cold, and I love it! However, the important part of this is her response. She's saddened, and after a pep talk, she gives her first and most sincere apology. 
Ladybug? Cat Noir? I'm sorry. <laughs> this moment feels earned, not only by the episode, but the series on the whole. It shows that people aren't as black and white as we might think, and that there are layers to even the most cruel of people. Not saying we should assume all bad people have a sad backstory, or that children should feel pity for their bullies, Diamond Tiara. What I'm getting at is that this scene shows that people can change, and that they won't be this static thing that will always be the way they were when you first encountered them. The rest of Season 2, and everything up until the finale of Season 3, show this. Chloe grew so much, she wanted to be miraculous again to show the one person she idolized that she was something her mother broadcast into the nation she wasn't. Exceptional. She wanted to be like her hero and show the world that there's more to her than shoulder pads and makeup. And she sure does. In Maledictator, she shows resourcefulness and the ability to get out of a jam even without her powers. She's a team player and is able to take orders while still being Chloe. Something other heroes have in common when they get their powers is a sense of confusion on what to do or how things work, but the way in which she was introduced as a hero allowed her to be more interesting and just kind of get it on some level. And I like that. At one point, Marinette straight up tells her she can't be Queen Bee anymore because everyone knows who she is and it would only endanger people more. Don't worry, put a pin in that, we'll come back to that later. But in some regards, she's right. In Heroes Day, she gets taken over by her family because she's playing superhero. And in Miracular, probably one of the best written episodes in the series, she's also taken advantage of because the bad guys know who she is and has a moment of self-reflection and doubt when Myura outruns her. And when she's told she can't be Queen Bee anymore, she straight up just goes, I get it, but you'll need me for sure. I love that, because when she's given the news, you can see her face twitch in anger because for once she listened to someone and is still being told no. It's such nice character work. Now you're probably thinking, wow, you spent the last two sections being really positive. Why do you hate this show so much, oh wise Christmas man? Well first of all, thank you very much, and secondly, that answer comes in the form of Battle of the Miraculous. This episode is fine on its own if you remove everything from Style Queen going forward that has to do with Chloe being Queen Bee and being told she can't again. because. In context, this episode ruins Chloe's character and was the start of the show's decline in writing. That's not to say this show had amazing writing beforehand, but the moments that were good or even great carried us through the bad ones, and season 3 did the worst thing you can do to a fan favorite character. They regressed her back to bitch status. Because of being overlooked by Ladybug again when her parents are akumatized, she gets goaded into turning evil by probably the weakest pitch ever. And in season 4, she is as bad if not worse than she was in season 1. Chloe went from being the best written character back to a shallow puddle of what she could have been, all for the sake of drama, rather than working with a character that has already been established to be worse because the creator couldn't help himself. You know what, I'm taking this one too. Her and the comb she flew in on. Let's go, my queen, we have some peasants to sit in judgment of. Characterization at all. I'm giving you the power to make more characters than you know what to do with. Have fun now. Characters in this show, besides the big four of Marinette, Adrian, Chloe, and Gabriel, are pretty much just archetypes or plot fodder depending on the given episode. This means that everyone outside of these pillars aren't given enough to fill up an entire section on their own, so they're just getting lumped in here. Gabe will be given his own dissection in the plot section as he's the driving force of it. However, I will give a tiny bit on the costumes of these four so they aren't absent, if that makes any sense. So with Ladybug, I honestly both kind of love and hate this fucking outfit because it's the entire reason the show is in 3D. It's been on record for some time now that had Thomas changed the design of her to a more 2D friendly one, the show would have been in that style. But he was so stubborn he couldn't do that, so now we have the show in its current form. Which, you know what, if the show was going to look like another generic anime, then I'm much more happy with the C tier DreamWorks knockoff. Although, I have to say, I get she's the main character, but by fucking... God, man, could you have given other people different outfits as well? She has, and I'm not joking here, at least nine other hero outfits alone. Hell, in season four, she started getting a change whenever she does her power for no other reason than because it looks nice. Cat Noir gets like five, and one of them is Mr. Bug, and one of them is him just pretending to be someone else. Like, my God, man. It honestly feels like Persona. Now, while the protagonist gets all the cool bells and whistles and has the ability to have several Personas at once, everyone else is basic as hell and only gets 
one. This goes hand in hand with what I was saying earlier. The show just can't bear to tear itself away from Marinette or give anyone else attention or the love they need. I understand having a main character, but when it comes to this show, it has this aversion to not being away from her for longer than it takes to monologue or maybe pee. Giving the focus to even the secondary main character for longer than half an episode is simply not the show's cards, apparently. Cat Noir actually leads me to a secondary point about this whole thing. I fucking hate the lead's outfits as they currently are. All alternate costumes, and even when they switch jewels, are just immensely better than the initial ones. I mean, look at this, there's color on him. The black gives dimension and accentuates his figure, while on her, the green line lets you see the outfit at all. I get staying on a singular color for the characters, but look at Pegasus or even Viperion. Singular color palettes, but with shades and different aspects of that color range to still be interesting to look at. Being monochromatic does not mean one shade of one color, it means being one color family. Also, before I move on, why the fuck does he sleep in his whole outfit until ephemeral? Because then he suddenly has a sleeping outfit afterwards. Did you make a pajama outfit for Marinette as far back as the pilot and then took four years to even think of making a set for Adrian and didn't notice till the hundredth fucking episode because you think giving this kid any kind of attention beyond the bare minimum would somehow be less feminist and we'll fucking get to that, I promise you? <gasps> Because honestly, that's what it feels like happened. For God's sake, all he has is a pajama set. Kim is in his trunks half the time, and he's a tertiary character. Give this kid some love, you insane radish man. <laughs> Queen Bee is probably my favorite transformation because it just looks so effortless. Like, this is what she was meant to do. Chloe's design is also one of the more solid ones because it has to play with two colors. And while they are generic colors, they've been proven to work together time and time again. There is one aspect about her I want to address. Unlike other users, her Kwame Pollen doesn't really have a personality or anything to say. Plague and Tiki obviously get the most characterization as they are out and about the most, but even Trick, Swayze, Fluff, Saz, and Roar get some pretty stark personality establishing moments. Yes, Swayze and Tricks are given to characters for longer than a span of a single episode, but it's different than that. Pollen is straight up just like, how may I serve you? And that's it. I know worker bees are supposed to be subservient to the queen, which also makes me really curious how a male holder would fare with him, but in all seriousness, even Nuru and Dusu have more character because they get to talk. Pollen is just kind of there, and it sucks because his grounded and rather subdued personality could have been a strong influence on Chloe if she was allowed to hold on to him for longer than a minute. You may have noticed that my favorite characters tend to be ones that have flaws that can be worked on or are framed as bad so that we get to see the growth of the character rather than just being left open like a wound slowly getting infected. Purple is the name of the day in this house, apparently. Honestly, this one's gonna be brief because his design is as bog standard as you can get. Much like with green, society has designated purple to be a bad color, so it's a no-brainer that they'd go with that. Not to mention that both green and red are complementary to one another, but also pair up well with purple, so this stands to reason for color theory. Even though the green part of this is significantly more black, but still, it's a nice touch. He has two big designs, a single episode palette swap, and... <laughs> Is that? Who designed this thing? He looks like Catman from the Justice League of America timeline. Holy shit is that bad. And that pose, it's like he's going, ta-da, look how bad I am. <laughs> Uh, this show's concept designs are so bad. Anyway, his base design is fine, it's just a purple suit with a chrome dome, which is fine. I don't get the cane seeing as it's not a weapon. I get it's to hold the Akuma, but he typically has to hold it to make it evil, so again, seems cumbersome. Something like Tigris would have fit better here anyway. As for Shadow Moth, it's the same thing, but with an added coat flap, a fan, and a DBZ counter for the extra jewel in use. Overall, his designs are fine, at least the main ones, but it's not all that interesting to go on about. It's a fucking business suit. It might as well just be a palette swap of his everyday outfit. Alia Cesare, her love interest Nino, will be covered more in depth later in the Love Diamond section of this thing, but for now I want to address a nasty undercurrent with her and Nino. While, yes, she gets more screen time than him, the two act almost as narrative foils for our leads, while also falling into the oh-so-not-fun pit of being non-white friend characters that are only there to be the moral support for the white leads. Alia gets it more so. Consistently, all she cares about is getting Ladybug's identity and getting Marinette with Adrian. Even though she has her own life and relationship to deal with, it seems she can't get away from this. Even so far, 
rise to becoming the Robin to her Batman in season four. Everything either revolves around Marinette's or Nino, and that's not something that should have ever been done. Other characters that we'll get to later that are in relationships still function on their own and don't have to be tied down to their dynamic to function. Alia, as the support friend, can't really do that. She's also the sassy variant of this trope, which I hate, but given the writer's track record with non-white people, I'm not surprised. Her design as Rena is decent though, the orange goes well on her. Too bad they had to fucking lighten her skin tone to put her in it. And no, this isn't a lighting thing. The scenes are the exact same before and afterwards. This is also a consistent thing, not only with her, but with Max as well. Fucking God, this show. Nino Lahim, much like his girlfriend, is the secondary support character to his white protag. The only difference is that his hobby is being a DJ, which is dropped at some point, as it gets in the way of being upset his best friend's dad is an asshole for the 20th time before breakfast. Which is fine on some level, and their friendship is one I genuinely like, and find very normal on Nino's end. Unlike Alia, he's much more inclined to stand up for Adrian and make things as fair as possible. The pilot showed this off very well, and subsequent ones reflect this as well. The difference is that much like Marinette, Adrian doesn't really reciprocate this level of friendship, and the show tells us implicitly that these four all met each other on the same day. Yes, kids form bonds rather quickly, but that doesn't mean they do anything and everything for each other all the time with no strings attached. Maybe for friends you've had since diapers, but even then, Chloe shows us that can't be the case every time. What I'm getting at here is that these two aren't so much as allowed to be their own characters. They're either latched to each other or their white counterparts and play support off that. And in all fairness, that's fine. Characters can be support, they can be secondary, but if that's all they do, they tend to get stale. To make an example really fast of a good and bad instance, look at, say, Morgana from Persona 5 versus Kyrie from any Kingdom Hearts game. Mona is a very independent character who acts as the player's voice of reason and walks through things with you, but still has a definite goal and personality separate from Joker. Kyrie is just anime girlfriend who is either kidnapped, killed, asleep, captured, or dead, and that's it. She's got like one major milestone under her belt, and that's keeping Sora from dying in three, but otherwise she's basically support in a bad way. She doesn't even heal you much, so even Donald is batting better than her. Back to Nino, I like that he gets to take up the mantle of the turtle. It works for him, and having an offensive tank is something I wish more characters besides Superman were able to make good on. You know, if I had a nickel for the amount of blue-tinted polite boys named Luca that I just want to hug till their spines pop that I've seen in the last couple of years, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Luca Kufain is my favorite character in the secondary cast. Why? Because while everyone else fills a utilitarian role, or is just there to get a miraculous, or be angry over something and then get all purple, Luca shakes things up by being one of the only sane motherfuckers in the room, and only truly getting upset when those he cares about or his passions are slandered and abused. Luca is in a unique position, where where, as far as I can remember, he's the only character to be motivated by others' pain to be the villain, at least the first time. The second time, it was more about how he was hurt that he just got dumped. Which, you know what? Fair. A lot of my friends say he's a boring character, but with how much the show has ones that are either batshit insane or just plain infuriating with how they're handled, it's nice to see a character who's just normal. He's content with his life and likes his role to play both in and out of the mask. Not every character has to be falling apart at the seams or even have to have a dilemma all the time. The two or three episodes where he has a problem to work with are good, and I'd rather have that than none. Not to mention his, what I'm gonna call, Gits episode, is a solid Adrian episode and a solid one for him, as it shows why the dynamics work in the mask as well as showing why his heart being the weapon makes sense. It's a metronome of sorts that helps the user think out a plan and work in time with their limitation. The fact it's a less powerful jewel is kinda stupid, but uh, every overpowered jewel eventually got a downgraded one. Like Purple Tigress is just Cataclysm but with a meteor strike rather than the touch of death. That's morbid. Also his design is cool and the way he puts on the mask is just adorable. Kagami Sarugi is overall just a female version of Adrian with a different result. Their upbringings are identical, and while Gabe used to be a decent parent, Kagami's mother is shown to be pretty inflexible from essentially the moment Kagami was born. Having said that, how she reacts to her lack of freedom is fundamentally different than Adrian. Where he mopes and gets depressed, she stews and gets angry about it and eventually lashes out. And yeah, he does do that at a later point, but that's mainly due to A, an Akuma, and B, her influence. All she wants is to be a normal teenager and be able to go hang out with people without having to lie. And because all this is so similar to the depressed banana here, I can't fully explain it without rehashing my earlier point. Along with that, I 
can't fully go into her or Luca's function in the romance department for a later segment. So all I'm left with is an oft under talked about aspect about her, and that's her impulsiveness and her conviction in her being right. When she first gets along, she immediately wants to prove herself and bum rushes in, despite the fact that it's not going to work, since that's all she and her mother have ever done. Sword fight. So she thought she could have the upper hand, but no. She actually had to realize she's out of her depth in that, and I'll commend the show on that tiny bit of character work. I'll also remind you that it's part of the show's Marinette is Never Wrong clause, so while I commend it, my enthusiasm is tempered. Hang on, let me fix that. Zoe was a very obvious attempt to get the fans to shut up about how much Chloe was addicted by the writing. Not only is she a similar design, not only is she the new owner of the Bee Miraculous, not only is she her sister, but their fucking names rhyme. It also isn't helped by the fact the show has her show up and get akumatized in the same episode, and then in the very next one, she's given the sodding comb simply to piss off Chloe, despite the fact any number of the already established heroes could have done this. Fuck, King Monkey was right there! What with the idea of A, this being an ape-centric episode, but also B, that his power is to literally summon a banana that fucks with people's powers. That's comedy gold right there, and would have made for a much better get episode for him. Aside from setting up Chloe as the new Queen Bee and then discarding her as much as they can, despite the fact she's in almost every episode after this as a side character, the show does nothing with her. They simply stop developing her besides explaining that she's lonely, gets along with the mayor, and isn't as bad as Matthew mathematically possible by virtue of the fact they've stripped all the nuance and good character work I listed above with Chloe. I'm focusing more on other characters around Zoe, because aside from slotting into the same position on the team Chloe did, there is absolutely no reason to introduce this character. Season 4 even gives us an out for this entire thing by way of Kuro Neku. That episode explained that you can change your appearance if you concentrate on it. So, in the same season, Zoe's entire purpose is thrown away. If they had just explained this concept to Chloe, none of this would need to happen. Also, that rule doesn't apply to Kagami, even though it's the exact same scenario, but fuck it, she's not Chloe, so I guess it doesn't matter. On her own, Zoe's a fine, albeit bland character, but what her existence does for the show is complete horseshit. Starlight Glimmer was a better base-breaking character. At least she was fun to throw a brick at. Natalie Sinker is Gabe's assistant. Initially characterized as someone just doing her job, somewhere along the line she became... well, Pearl. A devout follower desperate for her employer's approval, even though they are clearly in love with someone else and are just using the character in question as the tool they are. They were given to their boss on a silver platter and are used to achieve a goal that is antithetical to their own wants and needs, becoming the Olivia Newton-John to their John Travolta. This parallel even extends further when you realize that Natalie gave up her own health and well-being to the point she was bedridden and needed robotics to walk by the end of season 4, and that's almost exactly what happened to Volleyball, a pearl who was given to Rose before she was Rose and got our Pearl, and the funny thing is that neither character blames their abuser for using them like this. Volleyball eventually comes to terms with it along with our Pearl, but Natalie is still steeped in this cycle, and while Gabe seems to treat her with respect, so did Rose if you remember. A benevolent abuser is still an abuser. Just because they don't beat someone or physically harm them, manipulating them, berating them, and scolding them over tiny things is how that works even if they can be nice. Abusers are not one-note people, they can seem nice when they need to. That's the point. This is to say that Natalie is a horribly written character that is only here to pine over Gabe and get taken out of the fight for him so that he won't be out of commission so as to explain why Emily is in a coma. She's a utility character in the worst way. Apparently in season 5 she ends up leaving, but that doesn't change any of this for the past 4 seasons. It's still scummy. Volpina, I am Hawkmoth. I'm giving you the power of illusion. From now on, your lies will come to life. Lila Rossi is a fucking cunt. I hate her. Not only in the way we're supposed to, but also in just her for what she represents. Lila was clearly introduced to shift the schoolyard bully character away from Chloe and be a source of the cast and fandom's rage, but since Thomas is incapable of sticking to an idea he didn't personally come up with, the instant he got back into the sway of things, Lila took a back seat to the awfulness that is the season 4 Chloe Dragathon. Lila lies, cheats, steals, manipulates, and 
and overall is just a bitch to everyone who isn't Adrian. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? However, where Chloe got better, Lila was so sparsely used and only ever brought out for deplorable things that it's not a matter of what she's done, it's a matter of ratio. Because at this point, the show has given Lila zero redeeming qualities, motives, or even a hint at remorse for what she's done on any level. She's a bully through and through and deserves to get decked in the face. Where Chloe was Diamond Tiara, only done better, Lila is more akin to... I don't want to say Maleficent, as that would be a disservice to the Queen of Bad Bitches, but that's my closest comparison. She does everything out of spite, she's completely built her personality on lies, and overall, lies to get what she wants. The difference is that the show seems to want to keep her as this side thing, while pillaring Chloe for what she used to be and then reverted back to, because the grown man writing this can't get over his schoolyard bullies. For God's sake, the girl is using Gabe to get to his son and be with him just for the power and money she'd gain for it. It's fucking insane infuriating writing when this is somehow the more redeemable person in the writer's mind just because her daddy left and her mom works. Well guess what, Chloe has the same backstory in reverse and yet somehow she's worse. Also, making her powers as the chameleon being a reverse sleeping beauty by having to kiss them to A, turn into them, and B, get them to fall asleep is creepy and gross and why am I surprised at this point? Time to transform! Wait! Oh! No! Oh, oh. Wang Fu is a narrative device. He's the mentor figure, Mr. Miyagi without any of the charm. Fu's worst trait is the one the whole show has, his favoritism of marionettes. That's really what it all boils down to. He can have grief and trauma based on what he did as a child, but the way the show goes out of its way to make him single in on marionette is insulting at this point. Any normal show with two main lead characters would have had him train both of them to become the next guardian, then pick who he thought was the most deserving. But now that he's picked marionette, we're stuck in a scenario where she's under more pressure than usual and is in turn left floundering while Catboy here has basically nothing to do. I still say giving him the box and training him to be the next guardian while she's the one in charge and able to be the one with the most powerful gem in existence while he finds pride in having a bunch of new friends and the responsibility of being the box owner would have been interesting. Oh, and the box being right under Hawk Moth's nose would have just been the icing on that cupcake. But the thought probably stopped at he's got too much stuff going on with his dad's schedule which seems to be a plot device that comes and goes at random as it is. Compounded with that, he's basically done nothing but give this kid a purpose and then told him, nah, you're just the sidekick, in every sense but directly. You can see this pushing and pulling with every member of the cast, where Thomas wants them to be one thing, but other writers want to make them something that's actually worth a damn and delve into their characters that aren't solely devoted to sucking off this one ideal of feminism. The overwhelming problem with the show's character writing is that there isn't any. There's implicit writing, which is fine in small doses, but when it comes to characters outside the Big Five, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that comes even close to being written half as much as Marinette. Yes, having the main character be the most fleshed out makes sense, but when you have an ensemble cast this big, you have to delegate your time more, and when the cast is gendered so down the middle like this, and your male protagonist is locked in a cage half the time, and the show likes to hyper-focus on a select set of these female characters, it leaves very little in the way of having a well-rounded cast that lets people follow the characters along the journey. Not to mention, there's just a shit squill bastard ton of them, so that's just fantastic. It also makes the clusterfuck of a story they're trying to tell a waste. Which leads us to... Problem starter. You want things to be like they were, and to have your perfect life back? Well, you're in luck, because I'm giving you the power to make things as terrible as possible. The story of Miraculous has two major tracks running at all times, that being the day-to-day -day bullshit of our two archetypes and whatever their uninteresting problem is that week versus the Hawk Moth of it all. There is what I would call a subplot to the first half of the show, but I don't think it counts as one as it's so utterly woven into the main secondary plot that it just becomes that plot line. So this will mostly be about the superhero aspect of the show rather than the day-to-day -day things as that will get its own teardown here in a bit. So the hero shit of this is just... Well, it's really dumb, and all that that can't be fun, the villains of any given week are often what keep the episodes from being terrible, you'd think it'd be our main characters as they're the constants, but <laughs> no. You see, because this show has to constantly keep introducing new tertiary characters to not only its supporting cast, but also its Rhodes gallery, it makes it impossible to give a fuck about any episode beyond the macro, because in micro, you know everything will be okay. It also makes it so that you can watch the episodes in almost any order, give or take some weird continuity issues that I'll get to in a second, which is fine and even beneficial in the show's favor, given that you can effectively watch a complete episode from start to end at any given time, 
if you're watching season one. From season two onward, the big problem with the show's narrative is what happens in the last possible second of the episode Origins, which was this pseudo flashback episode that was also supposed to be the pilot, but was never given the proper framing device to work and thus just seemed way out of order and unnecessary, but is also just stupid for how it changes the plot. So in season one, the plot is very simple good versus evil shit, spliced in with some glitter force meets Spider-Man and Robin. That sounded better in my head, but the joke's solid, so it's staying. After Origins... Oh god, that's where things get complicated. <laughs> It turns out that Hawk Moth is Gabriel Agreste, Adrian's father, and that the entire time he's been trying to get the miraculous of our two tween eaters for the sake of fixing his mistake to bring back his wife who was in a coma, all of Mr. Freeze, or dead. It's never really explained, because she was the wearer of the Peacock Miraculous, you know, that one, which was damaged, and apparently the wounds of the jewel become the wounds of the wearer. I warned you, using a broken miraculous ends up breaking its wearer. The wounds on the miraculous are becoming your wounds. Who the fuck made that rule up? Oh, right. I mean, that's a simple and clean motivation that gets across his goals and wants for being a villain, and I'll even give Stoneheart the credit for him needing to draw out the Guardian to give the jewels to new people so that he can get his hands on them. There's just one problem. The Miraculous was practically mine, and they will be. Once I have them all in my grasp, I shall rule the world. I will be unstoppable. But one of these days, I'll be ruling the world. What is that? What the fuck? Yeah, his motivation is stated several times in season one to be taking over the world. He's treated as a Ludo or an Ursula or even a bog standard magical girl anime villain, which is perfectly fine for this kind of show. Putting focus on the main characters and letting the villain be this unknown Scooby Doo baddie who's just causing problems for petty shits and giggles works fine for what this is trying to be. Letting him stay there would have been perfect. And I'm gonna be honest, him being Adrian's father makes no sense in the narrative proper. It honestly gives me Rose was Pink Diamond vibes, in that in the beginning, she was treated as a rebel who took up arms against the Great Diamond Authority, but then was retconned into being someone who was fed up with her lot in life, started a coup because she was bored, and pulled the strings on both sides like she was fucking Xehanort. The show didn't see it that way though, and made it so that Rose was someone who did the best she could under her circumstances, even though Future goes out of its way to explain the damage she's done, not only to her closest friends, but also her own child, simply by virtue of the legacy she left behind. Miraculous is doing all of this in reverse. They're trying to force this character into a tragic figure doing this for personally satisfying motives that should come off as sympathetic to the audience. But... He was introduced as this cackling evil numbnut, unable to do anything alone, so had to dole out minions to get the job done, effectively putting the people of Paris in danger every couple of... hours, basically? Because wah wah wah, my wife died. Oh, did I mention that in order to save his wife he would have to rewrite the world, and thus might cause something else cataclysmic to happen, like killing people or even rewriting history? No? Well that's the price, and he's okay with it, even if it means potentially killing his son. This fucking man, I swear. You know what this reminds me of? Netflix's Castlevania. Just stay with me on this one, I promise it makes sense. In that show, Dracula's wife is killed for being his wife, and he swears vengeance on humanity because they took away the one person that made the world feel like it had any hope in it again. He's opposed by Trevor Belmont, the last in a line of monster hunters, a mage named Sypha who just wants to help people, and his own son, Alucard. The heroes are all set on this goal of stopping the man from basically killing the world and himself for taking his wife away, and they succeed. The show has four seasons, really only three because one is so short it's basically a movie, and the entire point of season two, as stated by Alucard, is we have to kill my dad before he kills us, and again, they pull it off. Trevor gets why Drag did this, but he's still like, yep, we gotta put down old sucker. Why am I bringing this up? Well, it's because this show did what this show thinks it's doing. Both men are monsters, but only one of them knows it. Dracula is sad and grieving the loss of his wife, and is being an absolute demon in the process, to the point he fatally wounded his own child so that he could enact his revenge during the year Al was in recovery. But the show never, and I mean never, frames him in the right for doing so. He is categorically the bad guy, and even sees how far he's gone by the end, and it hits you as this tragedy because of how it's framed. You see how hard he fights just to try and keep control, and to be the man he once was, but can't be, and when he's killed, you feel the pain of it. Gabe cannot be that, because the show wants to give him the option to be redeemed, or to have the viewer feel empathy for him, hoping he won't get caught, or that he'll get that wish, knowing full well that he won't die in the process. It's annoying is what it is. Dracula had 11 episodes to get that point across, and did it magnificently 
magnificently. Dave has had over 100 episodes, and he hasn't changed or moved or shows any sign of stopping because he just wants his wife back and fuck everyone else. The show's ratings won't let them kill him, and the show's writers won't let him be stopped. This all takes so long and so much time is wasted that I've simply stopped caring about his problems. That leads me to something else in this show that doesn't make sense. The timeline. So, in Ephemeral, we learn that everything in this fucking story has been happening for a year, even though physically that cannot happen. Dark Cupid happens as the 10th episode of the series. It's expressly set on Valentine's Day, which means that it happens in February, even though it's not cold at all. In fact, the whole show, besides the Christmas special, takes place in midsummer, which is not how any of this works. Speaking of said Christmas special, that comes between seasons 2 and 3, meaning that it has to come before Dark Cupid, which doesn't make any goddamn sense because if it did, most things in Season 2 don't make sense. Origins states the first event of Hawkmoth's attack happens before Adrian's birthday, one month after his mother's disappearance, so this tells us it's August, early August, but still August, which is damn near fall. So, in that time frame, Gabe is akumatized, everyone in the secondary cast at least once, a bunch of random people, one guy 73 times, and has even done it several times in one day if we go by the events of Sandboy and other similar episodes like Anti-Bug with Vanisher. This means, and yes I did the math on this, he's akumatized people almost every other day for a fucking year. Do you realize how much time that takes? He stated in the show to be a recluse since his wife died, which was originally implied to be quite some time ago, but now with this new timeline set up, it's less than a fucking year. And given how well Adrian's taking all of this, he seems to be coping just fine. He hardly ever agrees for his mother. In fact, the show treats it as if she died when he was a baby not less than a month ago. If the characters don't care half the time, why shouldn't the audience? Sure, it's brought up when we need our wife white boy sad point so the audience can feel like his character has been given any kind of depth, when in reality he's not. He's just been shown to be sad for the trillionth time, and it's boring. My biggest issue with the timeline is that if you think about it, there are 100 episodes at that point, and my number was lowballing this shit, because there are episodes like Ephemeral that show montages of different people being taken over, not to mention the movies and specials. Hell, Mr. Pigeon is apparently so frail mentally that he gets turned like four times a week. No wonder Gabe is an abusive father, I'm surprised he can function, much less be a fashion mogul or even a person. He's ravaged the city of Paris for a year and has done nothing but been a nuisance since the moment he put on that butterfly brooch. This man does not deserve your pity nor your sympathy. What he deserves is a swift kick in the balls and a long stint in prison. And we're still not done. This leads me to why Gabe is such a bad antagonist for this show, and why the plot falls apart the moment you think about it for even longer than a second. On the surface, the fact he's one of the main character's sidekick's parents is a cool idea, but when the show frequently and frequently either writes him out of an episode, or just ignores that aspect entirely, it makes that idea functionally meaningless, except in the two episodes where it's used to a good start, then gets fucked sideways like a train going through a tunnel. The only two episodes that show he cares about his son are Style Queen and Gorizilla, and I'm 90% sure those were added to make the people go, see, he really does care about his son. The problem comes in with Cat Blanc and Ephemeral, where in the former, he canes his son so hard in the face he flies half across Paris, and in the other, uses his grief to take mental control over him and subjugate him even farther. These are both what-if stories in the worst way possible, as they both involve different levels of time travel. Cat Blanc is so bad with this that it had to set up time travel like two episodes beforehand, at least if you go by the order on Disney+, Plus, which is the order most people are going to consume this in, so again, Again, don't give me that production order shit. Episodes get moved around and halted and even cancelled in this and many other shows constantly. Case in point, Psychomedian. Anyway, it had to establish time travel so close to itself so that its B-plot could make any sense. In this dystopian wank fest of a plot, it takes one of the better fandom ideas and twists it into a shut the fuck up about the romance stories. I'm not joking, the sole reason this episode exists is to justify the will they won't they shit because Thomas got tired of people bitching about how dragged out it is. The episode starts off with Marinette finally nutting up and giving Adrian a gift, but forgets to sign it, goes back in to do so, so he figures out she's Ladybug, goes off and starts dating her even though his father would have told him to like... I don't know, go play the Chinese or study his piano or something. But regardless, hooray, we have our pairing so this can stop. But no, because now we have future Bunnets coming in telling Marinette her actions on this day caused the end of the fucking world. Yeah. What makes this increasingly stupid is that it makes no sense. He tells Adrian what happened to his mother, and then turns him into a palette swap version of himself with infinite power. An argument makes him freak out and kill everything in the world, and then sulk for a bit. 
but don't worry, this will never have happened since we can just erase the events that caused it, which is something you're not meant to do by this show's own logic. Ephemeral does the same thing. This one has Adrian willingly tell Marinette who he is, and then they spend the next 10 minutes doing a cute montage of dating stuff and how good they are as a team, and then because this idiot says Milady, suddenly Gabe figures out the big non-secret and turns him into a remote that can fast forward anyone's time. This all sounds fine until the show just bullshits its own rules and lets Saz go back in time as far as he wants once, even though that's already what Fluff can do, so that he can have them undo the event that caused this, rather than, oh, I don't know, just letting Luca tell him he knows who they are, or even that they should be more careful this go-around? You know, what his power is meant to do? Both of these are examples of the show's pride and its arrogance in what it thinks its main draw is. Rather than being a crime-fighting duo who learn to trust and eventually fall in love with each other, as real partners and friends are one to do, they just shortcut it so that you don't get to have a cathartic payoff for any of this, or even feel a progression, except in the way they want you to, even if it makes no sense and feels as organic as a water bottle. Speaking of that, remember how I said Luca knows who these two are outside of the mask? It's because of his power to have a foothold in time that maxes out at 5 minutes, and he saw them both detransform in the same episode. How Luca's power works could have been useful so many times before it was introduced, but it wasn't because it would have broken the plot. And this is most evident in Heroes Day. If you either add in Luca or replace, say, Nino with him, then the entire plot of the episode unravels, because it's built on eliminating everyone but our two leads, which is exactly the thing his power is meant to combat. This also goes in tandem with the idea of power creep, but in reverse. So as far as I can realize, there are some ridiculously powerful jewels and some lesser variants that were thought of later because we need more toy sales. For example, the time watch and the snake bracelet. One lets you rewind time infinitely for upwards of five minutes, the other lets you go to any point in time you want and to whomever you want. Why would you ever use the snake unless you're fighting an army of people and need a backup plan? Why isn't that on someone at all times? Why doesn't Marinette and Adrian keep it and their other jewel? Why is it just left sitting in a box? One's like purple tigress like it because all that does is make a rocket fist, but this just seems dumb. Let's take another example. The late Ladybug earrings and the Ram barrettes. These two seem to have a clear, distinct power theme of creation. The problem is that the Ram is so highly specific, in that it needs to be able to trick someone, that it doesn't have any other applications since nothing he makes is real. Nathaniel can make anything he wants, but it's fake. It's a toy, while his boyfriend has the power to have any power he wants, which is stupidly overpowered. It would probably have never been used if not to round out the numbers. It's so highly specific and needs other powers to work that it becomes redundant. I know I mentioned this earlier, but Mark has the power to have any power he wants. Why doesn't he just use it to learn who Hawk Moth is and tell everyone so they can gang up on him? Hey, wait a second! By that point in the show when Cat Blanc aired, the team had gotten at least the main five plus Luca, so why didn't they all six go team up and fight Gabe? Jesus, fuck you guys are lazy. The show's utter lack of stakes and willingness to actually think out its situations means that it really isn't going anywhere, especially since it's been picked up to continue to season 7. And while the show is currently airing season 5 as I write this, it doesn't mean that as it currently stands, it shows a lack of understanding in what makes a good, compelling show. I won't lie, for a time in the middle of season 2 till about the middle of season 3, it was a fine show. Innovative characters, the villains were fun, and all that stuff was handled really well, but everything surrounding those good episodes are what make it a slog to sit through. Nothing is more evident in this than who I believe to be the worst characters in this show, Lila and Fu. These two aren't the main villain, but they might as well be given how they fuck with our main character's heads so much, I'm pretty sure Brainiac is asking for tips at this point. Lila was a character who was introduced, got owned by her own incompetence, and lack of ability to keep her lies straight, and then was promptly forgotten about for almost an entire season. She set up and left alone for so long, I'm willing to bet on first viewing when the show was airing, people forgot who she was. She lies, manipulates, cheats, steals, and demands things from people, and is shaping up to be Hawk Moth's successor. And somehow, some how this bearded hack thinks that's better than what Chloe has done, when in actuality, she was getting better and was the first person to shake off an Akuma. But no, she's the embodiment of Satan, apparently. Fu does this to Adrian, albeit to a lesser degree. Like I said earlier, rather than doing the sensible thing and having two pupils that he trains to see who is worthy of being his successor, he just leaves them to their own devices until Tiki forces Marinette to meet him, and then doesn't interact with Adrian at all until he's forced to, and then on top of that, ignores him 
pretty much until he's exclusively in the context of Marinette. I don't think outside of Siren, these two have ever had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, because rather than letting the characters make a decision based on who these two are, both in and out of combat, they just laser focus on the answer and fuck however we're supposed to get there, because the destination is all that matters, and getting there might as well be a checklist rather than a fun story. Characters and plot points aren't allowed to change in this show outside of the finales, and even then that's rare. Alia is still the only kid character who got to keep her jewel, and because of that, Season 4 had good dynamics, allowing her to be a lookout and backup character to Marinette, both on and off the field. Hell, Senta Bubbler is probably the best episode of Season 4 if you discount Pegabug having to be the one to save the day. This is why I think having Luca be someone Adrian can confide in would make more sense than just letting him stew by himself. Luca knows who he is, and while technically they are romantic rivals, having Luca be there for him and learn more about him and vice versa would have been great character work for both of them. Hell, Wish Giver explores that exact dynamic for a bit. The plot of this show, much like the rest of it, is bent around its main character in a bad way, where most shows, superhero and others alike to it, have the main character be the one to stop the problem, it still allows its characters and stories to feel like they're existing outside the range of its main character. Superman even did this. In the animated series, it did this very well. Yes, every episode has a conflict only he can solve, but there were episodes that had him be the one to help save the day, or be the one who was being saved. While he was the hero, he wasn't the only hero, and more often than not, was only able to get out of dodge by someone else doing a thing that distracted or helped incapacitate the enemy in question. Here, it's quite literally built from the ground up to need this one specific thing this one specific person has to get the job done. Remember that random item I mentioned Marinette? can make? Well, that object is key to stopping the bad guy. Once the bad guy is beaten, she rolls the credits, control alt deletes the damage, and the status quo is maintained. So every episode needs to involve her in some way, be it in the typical way, or in a stupid way like when Markov, Max's robot buddy, got taken over for the second time and had captured Marinette. But here's a little thing, she gave the earrings to Alia, and even though she has the fucking earrings, the plan was, let Marinette go so she can bonk you on the head and save our asses, which just... You really have a problem with non-white characters, don't you? Long story short, this show has a very warped perspective on how its plot should be handled, and in all honesty, should be ripped away from the hack's hands it's been entrusted to and given to someone else who knows what they're doing. Despite some good ones here and there, and even some brilliant fight scenes, I don't think this is something worth praising on any level. Its plot is bad, its characters are bad, its plots about getting its characters together are bad. And with that, I think we've held off as long as we can. It's romance time, kiddies. Diamond Dilemma. You love dynamics, huh? Well, good, because I'm letting you have them for as long as you want. So, if you haven't picked up on it yet, the Romance of Miraculous is... Well, I can't even say it's bad, it's more just non-existent at this point. It's such a ground-in topic that it simply isn't a question as more of a banal statement of the universe. And frankly, I fucking hate it. Now, you all know me, hey hi, how you doing? I love me a good love story, even when the thing they appear in is complete shit. But the way this show treats its love... Tetrahedron is appalling and should be studied on how not to write a serialized romance. This show does what I like to call Lois, Bruce, and Superman, in where one character likes one aspect of a secret identity but not the other, and also likes the civilian identity of another person but not the superhero side of things. Now, take that idea and put it in the blender, and that's this fucking romance arc. She likes him and he likes her, but he also likes her in the suit but more blatantly, and therefore just can't fucking date her outside the suit because... 14, I guess. I seriously never understood this. Dating around is the point of your teens. You could, and honestly should, go on dates with people you like as often as possible so that you get all the jitters out and figure out what you like in a person. It's not that complicated. But then again, we are in pseudo-anime land, so of course it has to be that complicated. That's the problem in a nutshell. I'm gonna expand on it in a second, but to distill it into a single word, complicated is it. And it doesn't have to be. There's nothing other than the writers getting off to all the money they're making, dragging this out and all the clout they're getting on Twitter, because fans are either too young to notice and just like them together, or are too old and bored and annoyed by all of this. And removing the self-imposed all-factory stop on this would alleviate the show's biggest roadblock and allow them to tell some engaging stories. Remember earlier when I brought up Cat Blanc and Ephemeral and talked about their relationship aspects? Well, the irony is that those episodes are great if you only look at the relationship stuff because that's the actual content of that relationship. And you know what? Much like Ruby and Sapphire, when they're forced to write this shit, it's actually cute and good and I want more of it. What happens is they then rip the rug out from the audience and go, fool ya, by having 
everything reset because time shenanigans. This is why I say either giving us this or going with other options would be a better use of our time. That way you get the fun romance you want and also don't alienate your audience and in fact giving the fans something to latch onto that isn't Gabe's weird obsession with the rotting corpse he has in his basement would be well warranted at this point. The other big looming problem over this love deca die deca logs is right that's a deck is 10 yes is that our other two options or even any other option is raised then quickly abandoned when someone got pissed off i don't know if it was thomas or if it was the 12 year old fans who got pissy marinette was making puddles over someone else and honestly i still find that kind of annoying luca and kagami were made for our leads and i mean that see luca calms marinette down and kagami lights a fire in adrian while that is a good thing in theory they don't really move beyond that and in fact compliment not only each other very well but the opposite lead they're assigned to as well much more than their stated ones luca more so than kagami since he's so laid back but in actuality i feel found Kagami and Marinette a much more compelling pair, given how Kagami focuses her and Marinette loosens her up. The closest it comes to is Alia, but that's again more the support of best friend camp than anything else. Kagami gives as good as she gets and tries for Marinette, and in turn, she tries for her. It's not framed as romantic, but the way the show treats this friendship, I'd honestly be surprised if they weren't secretly harboring a thing for each other. Luca, meanwhile, is just the sweetest thing, and pairing up the chilled up musician dude with a thing for manic people with the manic, high stress musician with a thing for normalcy is nothing if not a solid pairing in my mind. It reminds me of Nino and Alia now that I think about it, since they aren't super loud, but they're a constant in the show and each other's lives. This is also a big sticking point in the show's narrative, that our leads can't get together because it wouldn't work. The meta reason is that the show staff simply don't think the superhero relationships can work, but then has this be the smoking gun in the room that disproves that because A, they both know who the other secret identity is, and B, are the best damn couple in the show. That constant and never-ending trust is what makes them work. Their dynamic isn't all that complex, they're just teenagers in love and they work as that. But what makes it great is the moments where they sass each other, or have cute little hand signals, or a victory routine for when they win a game on their phone, and just little shit that, in fact, is used in a season 4 episode as a little blink and you'll miss it character continuity thing. Nino and Alia work because the writers gave it more than a passing brain fart to sit there and be a thing, and it works. They start dating at the end of season 2, and are still a thing way into season 5, and while there has been doubt, it's not like it's a bad thing. Doubt is healthy in a relationship, and the way they're handling it is a bit extra, but he's currently transformed, and she's a secret superhero right now, and even with that in play, they're still handling shit like adults. It's not hard to do this well, and the show staff consistently demonstrates they can do it, but don't because Ross and Rachel. The other big, glaring issue in the show is a lack of non-straight people. Now, I have mentioned several times both Mark and Nathaniel and Julica and Rose, and while those pairings are nice, they're more background elements than anything. For Mark and Nathaniel, it comes down to a lack of screen time, given that from their introduction, they don't really get a lot of utility until season 4, and I'm 90% convinced it was only done to remind the audience they exist, because otherwise, they are dropped until they're given the miraculous in the same episode as Ivan and Sabrina. What I don't get is why. Why set them up so well, and then not have them be a part of the group like they wanted? Yes, they're both introverted and would rather spend time with each other than everyone else, but they still have friends, they still went to that impromptu to party at Adrian's, and are friends enough with the girls to be invited to stuff, so I don't get it. In most non-straight relationships, there's usually one that hangs out with the opposite sex, to either spend time away from their significant other, or they just have a friend group that's separate from them, which is good, it gives breathing room for everyone, but because this show is incapable of having basic human shit on lock, they just are always together like they're a package deal, which is, again, fine on some level, but that doesn't mean that should be all they are in context to each other. They are tertiary characters, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't be given something to work with. Julica and Rose don't work like this. In fact, it's largely due to their relationship to Marinette that allows them to have a relationship in the first place. Because they're women, this puts them in the position to be in Marinette's inner circle, and thus are allowed to have knowing glances and little hand touches and sleep on each other on class trips, and just things that signal a real relationship. The problem is that the show is made in France, and unlike here in the States, they are more openly dismissive of non-cis, non-het people, and thus are more willing to ignore or condemn them. This does save the show from the overdone trope of the gay coded villain, most of the time, so that's something. Circling back to our leads for a moment, it really is bizarre how much the show wants to jump up and down telling us they're the only pair that matters, but then gives us moments of actual relationship growth with characters who are just there. I said before, the boys don't really get to do much since they aren't able to be a marinette circle jerk, but they're often just in the background doing cute shit, or drawing, or being in couple 
couple shots and it's good. Marinette and Adrian just get pining for each other and it's not worth it by the end. There's a lot of time where they swap the dynamic, where it's either Adrian and Ladybug, which means they're both babbling idiots, or they flip it to Marinette and Cat Noir, which makes them more... Well, like a real couple. They talk, they open up, they relate to one another, they laugh, they go to the movies. Just moments of them being there for each other with no expectation of doing so. They're simply friends who care. And that's basically a relationship only to a lesser degree. I've always said the greatest romances are best friends with kissing thrown in for good measure because it's true. Tell me Flynn and Rapunzel aren't the sweetest friendship put on screen and I'll show you a filthy liar. I'd take them over fucking Jack and Sally any day. Actually, that's what this feels like now that I've been it. If you'll indulge me for a moment, in The Nightmare Before Christmas, you have this walking corpse who's the monarch of a town dedicated to Halloween. He's loved, adored, and fawned over, but he's not really into the fame or notoriety everyone's been giving him. One of his biggest fans is a rag doll named Sally, who stalks him from afar to the point that she jumped out her own window to give him a gift basket. Not even talk to him, just giving him a gift. Yes, she is a prisoner in her own house and can survive the fall, but that doesn't make it okay that she's willing to dismember herself for a man who barely pays or any mind. Oh, he's nice to her and knows her name. He just doesn't listen to her or understand her wants. He's a little slow on the uptake, albeit in a charming way. She sings a sad song, he almost gets obliterated, they share a near-death experience, and then suddenly they're in love. That's what Adrian and Marinette feel like. While there is chemistry with the various personas and all that, it's almost like the show is aware how little the two have to work with outside this non-dance they do, so drags it out, because two people just looking at each other means they're gonna be a thing, and I hate that. The Fosters did that with its two leads in the pilot, and I legit went, oh, for fuck's sake. I believe that if the show had gotten these two together in season two or three, we'd have a genuinely amazing power couple. It's not hard to imagine it. In fact, we have proof it works in ephemeral. Would it make everyone squee when they keep fucking shit up? No, but it'd be more interesting, and there'd be good drama in how Gabe would try to break them up, or how their secret identities play into this, or hell, just a good double-double twist and a kind of funny argument about them finding out who the other is, and them starting off angry, then laughing, then getting all snuggly. That's just a solid dynamic to work on, and the show really doesn't want to do it because it's more profitable to keep it as tropey as possible. Romance in this show is on par with everything else terrible. Episodes like Kuroneku, Cat Blanc, and Ephemeral only exist to explain why they can't be a thing, but then also want applause for showing them as anything other than their barest character traits. Kuroneku is by far the best of this because it's an episode about Adrian and his self-worth, but the show comes down on it saying that he can't be quiet or reserved like she wants because otherwise she's gonna trip all over him. And that's not true at all because, again, Ephemeral. They work, but they keep inventing new ways to say no for bullshit reasons. I like my love stories. I like my romance, but I'm aware that isn't everyone's thing. But when you keep dangling shit in people's faces and not delivering on it, they stop being excited and they start getting angry. Even people who don't care about this aspect just want it to end so the stuff they do care about can get more focus. Just stop teasing people with it, guys. It hasn't been a good thing since it was introduced, and frankly, it's cheap tension. While we're on the thought of cheap tension, that leads me straight into... Flanderizer. I am Shadow Moth. I hear you want to make things as simple as you can. Well, I'm giving you the power to do just that and ruin everyone's day. Okay, so season four... Season four is shit. Like, I know this is the point of the rest of the video, but season four is just by far the worst. Season five will be omitted from this whole video because when I started writing this, it wasn't out, and I want to dedicate my time to that on its own later. Anyway, remember when I gave a small amount of praise to small things like Chloe's potential, or even the fact the plot seemed to be moving in an onwardly direction? Well, all of that is squandered. Any idea the show was getting better or trying to make it more bearable to watch, the creators simply turned up their noses and went, no. The Roman between Luca and Marinette? Gone in the pilot. Adrian and Kagami? Imploded. Marinette being obsessed with Adrian? Double, tripled, and quadrupled down on. Adrian getting left in the dark for no reason? This man is a black hole by comparison. Cheap tension that doesn't go anywhere? Have it in spades. And lastly, pinning all the personal bad things on Chloe will try to make Gabriel sympathetic. I know I said this before, but Gabe has gone too far for that to be the case. And while Chloe has done some repugnant shit, it was all personal, so on some level she could walk back from it. But for whatever reason, and she doesn't. She just reverts back to 
season two pre-style queen Chloe, and it's so infuriating to watch. Lila, surprisingly, doesn't make the many appearances until the finale, and honestly, it's for the best. There's not much more she can go down the chopping block, so might as well make her the catalyst to every season finale now. Felix, Adrian's identical cousin, born by his mother's identical twin sister, which Adrian reacts to like he's never seen her before. What was even the point of that? Anyway, with Felix, I'm torn on as he's literally only brought up to be a threat for season 5. All he does is suspect Gabe, then use the dog jewel to aid in the final scene twist, so again, what the fuck? I'm being rather general, but that's because season 4 has so little and yet so much going on that it's really hard to get into in a way I haven't already for seasons 1 through 3. Well, I guess there's the plot, such as it may be. So at the end of season 3, we're told that Fu gave up his powers and memories to save the identities of Ladybug and all the other users. Okay, fine. Shunts Mary into the leader role and forces her to be more responsible. Fine. But what I don't get is the memory thing in the first place. See, we meet someone from the monk temple that Fu's tragic backstory comes from, and it's said that the identities aren't typically hidden from the other users. It's only a thing Fu made up because paranoia. Okay, cool, fine. Why does he lose his memory then? I get it if it was an act, but it's not. He genuinely has no idea who anyone is or what's going on anymore, and it doesn't make any sense. My main problem with it is that it's not really got a point other than making the finale of the season make sense. The Kwamis don't really cause an issue, if anything they help more than they hurt, and overall, adding them to her arsenal makes it so that she can just pluck whichever jewel she wants at any given time with no consequences. The ironic thing is that now Alia gets to keep her necklace all season, and it only serves a purpose to piss Adrian off that she gets to keep hers and Ladybug knows who she is. And you know what? I agree. It's bullshit. There's even an episode devoted to her proving her medal so that she can keep it. And guess where Adrian is? In a literal bubble off screen half the time. I swear this show treats him like a toddler half the time. Suhan, the guy from Fu's past, doesn't even really do anything. He shows up, stirs the pot, and then hops off to be a little shit somewhere else. The only two episodes he appear in are the one he's introduced in and the embodiments of wasted potential. So so I'm left to wonder as to what his point is, other than maybe being an in-universe representation of what the creators think the fans are like. That's something the show has been doing a lot recently, and in this season it's especially egregious. There are, if my memory serves correctly, five episodes that snipe at the fans for existing in one way or another. Furious Fu, Soul Crusher, Queen Banana, Simple Man, and Ephemeral are all episodes that either by one character acting a certain way, or by its very nature and plot, are critiques of critiques. Fu is all about the perception of the secret identities, Soul Crusher is about what they think we want from Chloe versus what she actually is, Queen Banana is all about digging a deeper grave for Chloe and stroking Thomas's ego, Simple Man is telling fans to fuck off on what the actual problems are, I'll swing back to that one in a second, and Ephemeral is just Cat Blanc, but worse because it's actually decent for 95% of the runtime. None of these are worth anything, and the only real reason to watch Soul Crusher and Queen Banana are because they introduced a new main character and her role as a less interesting Queen Bee back to back. Why they sped ran this, I have no idea, but I guess doing that quickly is better than not at all, like in the case of these four. I feel so bad for them. Rose got a whole episode about her growth as a character, Julica got the same and so did Milan now that I think about it, but these two were just pushed aside for nothing. Simple Man is somehow just an amalgamation of spite that I'm surprised got greenlit past the pitch stage, but I guess when your head writer is best friends with a producer, you can get away with anything apparently. Simple Man is just the writers thinking the criticism we have with the show is that it's too complicated. Now this at first glance could be looked at as if it's the parents or grandparents not getting how complicated modern shows are and you have to have the suspension and disbelief and wonder of a child to enjoy them. But no, it's just more shitting on fandom stuff. And while I'm all for this when it's done well, when it's done to lick their wounds, I start to get a little testy. Simple man, candy for miraculous. Everyone loves candy. Not to mention, this is all real to them. Like, this is their world. You can't make a meta commentary on a complicated plot when the complicated plot is your day-to-day -day life, guys. What the hell? Simple Man is just that. Nothing but spite and hatred and anger at people being mad the show is bad and the writers deciding to take that personally rather than fixing the issues people have been pointing out for a very long time. What it lacks in a point is only made up for its utter lack of getting to its conclusion. Problem is, there's actually a joke in here I really like. It's when the kids are trying to explain how to beat the bad guy and Adrian just very deadpan goes, Can I just cataclysm the bad guy? And it always hits me every time. Not only is it because his actor just hit the nail on the head, but also because, yes, kill the bastards. It's not like consequences are a thing in this universe. 
at least not long lasting ones that is ephemeral is somehow the worst thing the show has done there are worse paced worst looking worst acted and worst written episodes but this one had so much potential for the show and they threw it away it actually stress tests the main relationship of the show and it works out really well it's just that for once gabe has an ear for words and notices who his son is and of course the world goes to shit for it because why not that's really it on my first viewing i was excited to see what they were going to do from here on out but then nope they just reset everything meaning not only was this a waste of effort it's also a waste of time if you skip this episode nothing is lost and while there are a lot of episodes like this in every show with this one it seems written to be forgotten which is just not good writing what is good writing is something they never take advantage of i mentioned earlier that luca knows these two's identities but for some reason never tells them aside from the honor code thing and honestly him just saying he knows would fix this episode in a heartbeat and like i said earlier fix the whole idea of adrian not having a friend to confide in like marinette has it feels like an oversight or at the very least not fair the others that are just straight up bad are things like guilt trip where julica feels bad she told her friends about her girlfriend's long-standing condition so falls into a depression pit and said pit hating adrian so hard so fast that he almost attempts suicide not as a joke as a literal thing he tried to do almost instantly cataclysm What the hell, man? That's terrible! This season also does that thing in superhero shows that I hate, where they just reuse a lot of older villains and then don't do anything else with it. Like, it's the same thing, but with a different weakness, and it's annoying in any media. The only two that get a pass are Crocodile and Glossiator 2, because the former was a decent concept about combining two prior villains, and was a pretty decent get episode for Julica, and the latter, as it's one of the few times these fuckers talk about anything at all. I will admit that Andre is being a fanboy in that episode, and it's more meta shit, but at the same time, the rest works for me, so I'll let it go. There are a lot of throwaway episodes that don't really do anything, and I'm not saying filler, because that word has gotten to the level of Mary Sue at this point, in terms of how the internet likes to throw it like fucking Tic Tacs. What I mean is that they aren't fun or engaging, and the thing that may or may not be introduced in them is just not as interesting as it is later when it's brought up. Penalty Team is just bad because it introduces four heroes at the 11th hour when you could have done three of them several times throughout the season. Example, Pigeon72 could have gone from its cringe fest self to be about Nathaniel creating stuff to either capture or distract the pigeons. Optigami could set a whammy Hawkmoth's way by making Mark a new hero that allows him to outthink Style Queen. While I would miss the design of Ladybug with the design of the bee on top, it makes more sense to have the clever writer outthink the blunt villain in a creative way. And for Ivan, just make him a distraction and gang of secrets. Milen is his girlfriend, so of course he'd want to help and get her back. He literally has a bum rush ability, so it would be good for taking on multiple foes. Leave Sabrina for Penalty Team, and boom, each get an episode that introduces them organically and solves the pacing and character issues in the episode. In general, season 4 just has less of an identity than the other seasons. With those, I could point to them and give a very general one sentence description that explains their core traits. Season 1, Monster of the Week status quo setting action comedy with a dash of shipping bait. Season 2, Chloe Redemption and Team Dynamic shakeups. Season 3 starts strong, then ends up buckling under its own ideas and walking back character work because childhood trauma. But with season 4, I can't really do that. There's a lot of ideas in there and there are a handful of episodes I enjoy for one reason or another, but the general tone feels bad. Like, when I think of the season, I can't think positively or see merit in it. It feels, looks, and gives off the vibes of insecurity, and not in the fun character way. It's in the way you can see a property flounder under the weight of trying to fix shit that isn't working with other shit that isn't working. Some episodes just feel like they're killing time until the new power is introduced so they can go home, and others feel really engaging and fun to see, while others just seem petty. I do want to look at some good episodes before I move on though. Optigami, Senta Bubbler, Kuroneku, Wishmaker, Dearest Family, Crocodile, Gabriel Agrest, and Psychomedian are all episodes I think work really well, both in and out of context. They're either strong character focus pieces or an engaging plot, be it a mystery like in Gabriel or a fun chess match like in Senta Bubbler. Dearest Family can be grating given the titular family's squabbling, but the tiki shit is way too funny on its own, and seeing Marinette stuff her face uncontrollably is kind of funny, not gonna lie. Wishmaker is the one that seems to embody most of these traits. It's a really solid character piece that shows off the best of Luca, Marinette, and Adrian. It has a really silly villain idea, a status-changing event that should mean something but was never capitalized on, but that's more future episodes problems, not this one. And at the end, Alec, my 
God, there are too many fucking A names in this show. Adrian, Andre, Andre again, way to be creative, guys. Audrey, okay, now you're just being spiteful. Alia, Alec, Alex, Aeon, Ali, Fabulous E, and Amelia. And those are just the fucking important reoccurring characters. You can pick other names, you know. Anyway, Alec changes his outlook on life and becomes... RuPaul, I guess. Regardless, he grows from this experience and becomes a better person from it, and it's a shame more characters don't do this in the show. Most just go back to being themselves and or never appear again after their debut, and that's just bad. The finale is fine, it's whatever, I'll cover it in the conclusion, but I'll give it credit, it sure was something to follow. Take with that what you will. And that's season 4 in a nutshell. It wasn't very good. It's got a lot going on and some really solid ideas, but its parts are greater than the sum of its whole, and it's not what it could have been. You may have noticed that I left out one episode in this entire 10 minute section on the season, that being Chi Lin, and that's because we have to talk about the show's racism and general arrogance of its creator to really dig into that one. So it's time to talk about Thomas. Executor. You feel like no one appreciates you. Nobody sees you for the genius you are. Well, I'm going to give you the power to change that, no matter the cost. Thomas Asterix is an awful person. Not because he made a show I dislike, there are plenty of people that I hate that make good things, or even good people who make bad things. No, what I mean is that he's a bully, a racist, and in general, just a bad person. He's shown time and time and time and time again that he's willing to pick fights with people over literally nothing, is so willfully ignorant of political ideas outside of his own, and has the self-awareness of a gnat. He's not even well liked by fans of the show, and the only reason he continues to get work is because this thing got popular. But but it's not even him to blame for that. The best episodes are often written without him, and he's so self-indulgent he's put himself in the show as himself and is treated like a tortured artist who's underappreciated. The man is the epitome of a bearded hack and has so little in the way of critical thinking that it baffles me to my core sometimes. There are countless forums, subreddits, twitter threads, and tumblr blogs dedicated to showing the insecurity and immaturity of this man that is downright laughable. While yes, biting back against people who have had a bad take is a fine thing to do from time to time especially if it's clear where they're wrong and how you can articulate it. Calling children names is just shooting yourself in the foot. I've mentioned several times in this video that Thomas has issue with women, and that shows throughout the show. His main character is about as close to an author's pet as you can get, while every other woman is either a bitch, a monster, a doormat, or Asian. Put a pin in that, we'll come back to it. The only exception to this rule is Alia, and as stated earlier, she and Nina fall into the secondary non-white best friend character to the white leads. Chloe has also been shown a lot in this video, but it bears repeating, she was made to be a representation of his bullies from school, but then someone else tried to write her better, and so he just reset her for no other reason than spite. And he calls Lila a girl who has willingly sided with the villain just because she was found out to be a liar, and is willing to put Paris in danger just so that she can get a boy, is somehow better than Chloe. While Chloe has done those things as well, she shook off an Akuma, she believed in people, she wanted to be better, and felt bad when she knowingly fucked up. Lila just bats her eyes, and because the plot has to happen, Happen, gets her way. Also, her name is Lila and she lies a lot. Real creative naming there guys, 10 out of 10, kill me. None of that can hold a candle to the Asian characters though. Let's start with the small stuff. All Asian characters, whether they have ever been to or from the continent, have an Asian name or are very beholden to that culture. That's all fine and well in some ways. You don't have to adopt an entire culture when you move somewhere, and I'm all for people keeping their heritage. However, the amount of people I've met that are of other nationalities that don't have that heritage in their lives or very little of it is astronomical to the amount of people who do. The only exceptions I can think of are people of Muslim or Middle Eastern descent, or those from India. While yes, there are others, the way our society has evolved, we've lumped fashion, aesthetics, food, and even some religious practices in from people of Hispanic backgrounds and other similar cultures. This even goes for the show as well. For example, black characters, Hispanic characters, and Egyptian characters, all of whom are in the main and secondary cast, are not shown doing things or having names that are directly tied to their heritage. Max is a skinny nerd who is more in love with his mother more than his own mother sometimes, Alia is a media savvy blogger, and Nino is a hip guy who wants to be a DJ. For fuck's sake, those names aren't even tied to their nationalities, they're just names. Well, Nino just means boy, similar to the word Nino, which is a term of endearment. I'm explaining this because characters like Marinette's Uncle Cheng, who is voiced by a white guy, speaks poor English. Not his fault, he lives in China, so not exactly like he's speaking it every day. Is turned into a fluent English-speaking food version of Goku, with the goal of eating Chloe 
and has weapons based on nothing but food. I get the point, he's a Chinese guy who's a chef and he's in a cooking based episode. And I even get that the Goku thing is just a joke about how he's always hungry, but why did you have to make him want to boil Chloe into his soup? You could have made it so that he just wanted her to try the real thing, or kill her if she didn't. Still steaks, heh, <laughs> steaks, driven, but not cannibalism. Baker X is also food based, being literally made of bread and yeast, but he doesn't want to eat people, and he's not even a racist caricature. He's based on what looks to be Viking culture, and is done by a white passing French character. Kagami's mother, Tomio Surugi, is pretty much the same, only instead of it being one facet of her character, it's her whole character. She's strict, she only wants her daughter to do academic or career focused things, and for some reason, and she's blind. I mean, go representation and all that, but I don't get why she is, other than it being a weeby homage to the blind sensei thing in anime. I mean, she's got a bamboo cane, she wears only sandals, and is dressed in a traditional Japanese garb all the time, and for some reason Kagami's in a school uniform, even on her off days. It's really stupid, and when she transforms, she's a vaguely themed Japanese centaur for no reason. Kagami has at least one transformation as her post that I like, because it's based on the situation and her genuine anger at losing, so that adds up. The other one is just abhorrent. First off, its name is Onichan, which translates to Demon Child. Her power is to transport to the person she stuck the horn onto via cell phone. Don't ask, that part's actually explained. What isn't is... Well, the name and design. The rose I'll grant is justified, but, and I'm being as serious as I can, the mask, fangs, and name are never explained. It had nothing to do with her other than she's Asian, and it's fucking weird. Oh, and in this episode, the reason she was upset and got vilified to begin with was because Lila sent her a picture of her with Adrian, which, I can attest, fucking sucks, and makes you want to just break down and die for several hours. And that's the time Kagami is called a literal demon child? Fuck you. All of this could be a massive coincidence if they were on their own case-by-case -case basis, but all of them at the same time has to be deliberate. Chi Lin is all of this times a hundred. While the dragon this episode is based on is meant for gentleness and kindness, which embodies Sabine to a T, it doesn't make sense for how the show has done its villains before. Let me back up. This is the only episode in the series to focus on Sabine as the main character, which is fine given that she's Marinette's mother, so not a huge player in the events of the story. But it's shown in this episode that she's apparently a master planner, someone who still practices feng shui, does yoga, and even has a painting class she teaches. All well and good, still only pulling from her Chinese heritage rather than the place she lives now. Well, I guess painting is universal, but still. The issue comes in when it's suddenly what defines her in the episode. Literally. When she's on the bus and Marinette borrows her purse with her ticket inside, this Korean officer has Roger take her into custody for no reason other than being racist. This was shortly after the start of the Asian hate movement blew up on the internet, which, yes, it deserved to. Very important movement. And I'll give the episode its credit. It tackles this well, but and I need to stress this, I have no idea why, but they made the thing she turns into be a peaceful, gentle creature that airbends like she's in Dragon Ball Evolution, and all she wanted was her handcuffs off. What the fuck does the wind have to do with this? It should have been a role reversal power, similar to what Dark Blade or Roger Cop were, taking control and showing them what it feels like to be hated for the sake of being hated. Again, fine concept, but the villain transformation is only the way it is because of her race, and it's a consistent problem throughout the entire show. Other villains don't get this treatment, and if it is based on their race or geological point of origin, it's a little more subtle or based on widely accepted things about their archetypes. For example, Bafana is a Russian woman who is also Marinette's grandmother. She owns a motorcycle and her object is candy. Right there you get her basic setup and it's not all that complicated. Old lady luring in children with candy is a widely accepted thing in the cultural lexicon. See Hansel and Gretel and even Baba Yaga in German and Russian folklore respectively. You don't need those stories to get this general point, because it just makes sense and the episode itself explains this by just showing them off. Another example is Where Dad, where it's a pretty big Beauty and the Beast homage along with Jack and the Beanstalk plus a little of the whole woman doesn't need a man thing even though we fucking get it, she's the main character. Sandboy is a Sandman slash Monkey Paws thing and even the Safeties are explained in the episode as a bedtime story to keep the girls in line. Lady Wi-Fi is based on 
from Aya's blogger half and her dedication to finding out Ladybug's identity. Stoneheart is all about Ivan's emotions. Hell, it seems like Gabe can choose what the person turns into, given he made Natalie Catalyst and himself the Collector both times. So it's not like the jewels, which mimics the person's heart to be their ideal hero. Which, side note, if this is her idea of a good hero outfit, she's a bad fashion designer. Her season 4 Lucky Charm outfit is way better. This clearly isn't a character choice though, it's a writer one, and it feels like that because the writer just cannot write shit well enough to be good. Also, just a side note, in the New York special, the plot revolves around a guy getting a beefed up version of the eagle necklace, because apparently America has its own box and France has the one Fu stole, but whatever. In it, the bad guy releases all of the heroes of their hyper-specific inhibitions. I'll save one for in a moment, but our Superman and Batman analogs are essentially stripped of their honor codes. Majesty, you're afraid of your own power. I release you from your fear. Nighthound, your morality keeps you from bringing justice more swiftly than you wish. I release you from your code of ethics. And rather than using that lack of inhibition to beat this asshole nine ways to Sunday, they just start acting like children so the actual children can do the saving. God, that is stupid. Anyway, racism. In this special, they actually have a Native American girl, have woven earrings, pigtails, and get the miraculous of the eagle that grants the power of liberty, and whose call sign is literally saying, Wings of Liberty. Just, not an ounce of nuance in your soul, is there? Hey, guess what? Hey, guess what? It somehow gets worse! Her adoptive sister is a black girl that is coded as autistic throughout the movie, and is also a literal fucking robot, so she's not even human. Oh, and she almost dies, by the way! Along with that, the president, who is also a black woman, sets off the world's nukes the second she's freed from her bonds of, and I'm not joking here, her promise to keep people safe. Victor, he once swore you would devote your life to protecting people's freedom. I release you from that promise! What the actual fuck is wrong with you? No, seriously, I've tried being calm, I've tried being reasonable, I've tried to chalk it up to differences of culture and all that, but what the actual literal fuck is wrong with you? That is so nakedly racist and fundamentally shallow on how you view people that it's disgusting. The Shanghai special isn't much better, the new character is all about Kung Fu, she keeps bringing up her adopted relationship rather than just calling him her father, and she transforms into the embodiment of the Chinese Zodiac. There's representing one's culture, and then there's being a stereotype. Not to mention that, including Faye, everyone in Shanghai is a dick to Marinette, which itself is not a great look to have all the actual minority people bullying the white passing character. Just wanted to throw that out there. This section is about Thomas, but I had to give concrete examples in the show itself to show that you can't ignore this. You can't just pretend his bias against women or against non-white passing people or against the very notion of criticism is something separate from the thing you're watching. You just can't. He's a thoroughly incompetent man who deserves a good beating with a stick. The thin whippy kind too. This man is so self-absorbed and desperate to stroke his own ego and martyr complex, he made himself the victim of an episode where no one knows who he is or what he does despite his name was on every goddamn thing in this franchise, which should not be a boasting point, and even named Marinette's father after himself. Get over yourself, you self-indulgent, waste of fame, bearded hack. I have nothing left to say about him other than, what a piece of shit. What an abhorrently awful person. A show I saw a lot of potential in has just been twiddling its thumbs and been made worse by the myopia of this man. I hope the industry realizes his issues soon and send him to therapy so he can get help. That and he needs to have his Twitter taken away until he can act like a grown-up. Conclusioner, it's almost time to go. Wrap this up for me, would you? Miraculous Ladybug is a show I really, really tried to like. It's a show that has a great cast, nice designs, and even an interesting premise, but from top to bottom, it just fails on all of it. The plot is too dragged out with a villain whose motives change halfway in, the main character never really learns from her mistakes, and the secondary protagonist is left in the green room while the real hero does all the work. Nothing flows, nothing connects, and when they do, it's almost like nothing matters from it. The show has potential, every show has potential, but when it comes to actually following through on it, they don't. Characters are introduced and never used except when it's convenient. The main character has so many issues I'm surprised she can walk much less function on any level, and the character it would be interesting to follow is left alone to be sad. Villains are forgiven for no other reason than plot, and the ones that aren't are simply left spinning their wheels and treated as a joke. And the entire central conceit of the show has just been fucked off with with no semblance of care given to what's happening. I wanted to save the season 4 finale for the conclusion, and the reason for that is that it seems like it was trying to fix its own mistakes, taking away the jewels to get rid of the hero inflation, which by the way, I called like a month before the episode came out, having Felix be a secondary antagonist for variety, and I'm not gonna lie, the finale was interesting, but it also highlights the biggest issue I stated earlier, Marinette is never wrong. She fucked up, she was outplayed, and she lost. She lost the Miracle Box's contents, 
Undoubtedly, this is where the people of Paris would finally see that she can fail and pull a Spider-Man and have people actively hate her for once. Finally, the series would show this girl some consequences for at least one objective thing she has fucked royally. But no, she is still cheered and lauded as a hero. No one is mad at her, no one seems to care. They just cheer her on because even the darkest hour can't be that dark. Hell, they were madder in Heroes Day when they thought she killed Catboy, proving, once again, the whims of the writer are more important than even the emotional logic of the characters in the thing they're writing. It also doesn't really resolve anything. In fact, it only added to the chaos of it all. Much like a lot of the episodes in the rest of the series, it has a good first and second act, but its resolution is always leaving you wanting, meaning you can't be satisfied, and so it goes from an episode-by-episode -episode story to one large story with no breathing room. And to write off a potential comment before I get it, just because a story isn't finished doesn't mean that it's not flaming shit now. Episodes that are not multi-part things should stand on their own, even if they connect later on. Just because season 5 is the end of Gabriel or whatever doesn't mean seasons 3 and 4 have to be bad for the episode where he stops being a threat to matter. If I could fix one thing about the finale of season 4, I would have swapped their powers for a season just to shake things up and as a safety net in case she feels she can't be trusted. It would add a new dynamic, it would be good character work, and much to my surprise, from the brief glimpses of season 5 I've seen, they do do this at least once, so color me surprised. I still chalk that up to sheer numbers on my end. Hell, if I were them, I'd just do it to be good for toy sales. But hey, that's just smart, and we can't have that now, can we? If you're wondering, my favorite episode of the show is Wishmaker. While there is a big plot reveal, it's more just a fun time with nice characters and good jokes. I want people to live their dreams! Would you really call this a dream? Look, look, I'm a cucumber! Look at me! It's the best the show has to offer in terms of its episodes. My favorite moment, though, is a small one. It's the one where Adrian is Cat Noir and Marinette just sit and talk. The show does this a lot with this specific version of the pairing, and it's a good one. Without the love angle, they let their guards down, and it's sweet. They just vent and talk and feel things out, and it's nice banter and dialogue, and it's what the series needed so much more of. If the show had stuck the landing on these, actually paid them off, and made a genuine effort, then we wouldn't be here. But they don't, and we are. While episodes like Reflect Doll and Psychomedian are great, there's always something in the back of my mind with them. But with these, I can't. They're just good. And that's what I was always holding out for. It's why I stuck around as long as I did. I was always hoping for moments like this that weren't trailer bait or fan service, but they never came. Personally, I would never let a child in my care watch this. While there are good themes and some decent action for what it is, the warp priorities, problematic main character, and its frank unwillingness to fix any of the issues it has, and instead opting to tell fans to shut up and snipe at them for having a thought that's not in lockstep with the creator, make it something I cannot see being good on anyone let alone a child. This show had so much promise, and let everyone down with it, and failed every character it gave us, some more than others. Nevertheless though, they were all failed. This show was a lot of things, but what it never was, was miraculous. And that's a damn shame.